All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, welcome one and all to Drexel's Digital Media Showcase 2021. We are here today with um, 13 incredible senior project teams um, and, a, and as well as a number of videos showcasing our student organizations, uh, some grad work uh, and some junior workshop stuff, lots of cool stuff happening today. And I'm so thrilled to have you here. With me today is our department head, uh, Michael Wagner, and I'm gonna give him a chance to talk, but first I get to talk first. Um, I wanna make sure that you, that, uh, you have a, a little bit of context for what you're about to see. You're going to see the end result of 12 plus months of blood, sweat, and tears from almost 100 different seniors from Drexel's digital media department uh, and the computer science uh, uh, departments. We've got animations and visual effects. We've got interactive games. Um, we've got social media web apps. All of these are... Uh, the result of the students coming together in their junior year and starting to kick around ideas. Who do they want to work with? Who do they want to have their, as their advisor? What kind of big, overscoped, massive project are they going to attempt? And how much will they have to cut it back to get something done and polished by this time today? And uh, they've all gone through that. And it's been quite the long road. And obviously, under extreme circumstances like the rest of the world, last year's senior project was surprised by the pandemic lack lockdown and had to adjust at the last second in that final term. But this team, these teams today, um, this cohort of 2021, they started under those conditions. And it's been a challenge all the way through, but they have responded remarkably well and have achieved great things. And that's what we're here to celebrate today, to show you these incredible projects and the wonderful things that these students have achieved. So today we're going to uh, give each team a chance to present and then we're going to have a little chat. We have some wonderful alums that are going to come in and join us for those conversations. Uh, those alums have been out in industry for a while, um, building their careers. And it's pretty exciting. So, uh, but I want to make sure that uh, we sort of have a bigger picture of the digital media department and all of that. So I want to throw it over to department head, Michael Wagner. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for this nice introduction. And uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of additional context. Um, as many of you know, uh, the digital media department or the digital media program at Drexel University is one of the oldest digital media programs in the nation. And therefore, we have a long history in producing uh, content, producing student work. And one of the things that has been historically the most important aspects of our program is the senior show at the end of each year. Um, over the last couple of years, this has become a major event with hundreds of people attending in real life. So unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, that important part uh, needed to be redesigned. And one of the things that we decided very early on is that we wanted to make sure uh, that we take this as an opportunity to really move forward, to not see this as a negative impact on anything, but really kind of to use it as an opportunity to propel ourselves to the, to the, next, to the next level and to prepare our students for the future. So we decided very early on that we are not going to cancel anything. We did not cancel any classes. We did not cancel any events. We did not cancel senior show. We kept everything exactly the way it was. The only thing that we changed is we moved it into a virtual space. Um, now, um, there are two cornerstones to our senior show. And the first one is that it is a life event. And the reason for that is because it needs to be a, a sort of almost a ritual. We wanted to make sure that everybody sees the work that our students are doing and that every, everybody is, is celebrated for their enormous accomplishments that they were able to achieve over the, over the last four years, really. Um, so, so we needed to have it live. So we didn't want to have anything pre-recorded and, and, and then kind of put on the internet. We wanted to make sure that the, 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 the life nature of this event is kept 
alive. And the second thing and that is equally important for us, we wanted to make sure that every single student can speak and every single student in our program will speak today. Uh, and, and that turned into a major broadcasting production, as you might expect. So last year, fortunately, uh, under the leadership of Rob Lloyd, we were able kind of to do that almost without any preparations, uh, almost immediately. Now we had a year kind of preparing for different kinds of things, but it is still a major production and it is happening in the Rob Lloyd residence. And at that point, I actually also need to make sure that I uh, that I give a big shout out to to Calder Lloyd, uh, who is essentially working with Rob Lloyd um, and uh, is the nerve center of this broadcast in the Lloyd residence. Uh, we are going to a pool somewhere close to I, I would probably around around 80 to 100 video streams and Calder needs to juggle those and kind of make sure that everybody is seeing exactly what they're supposed to see. So if there are any issues, uh, please, please bear with us. Uh, I, it should run everything reasonably smoothly. We did, we did a dry run earlier today and everything was fine. But as these things go with a live event, especially with, uh, with that many students participating, there are all kinds of things that can happen. Um, and, and that's essentially already everything I wanted to, sh to say. Uh, we have a lot of content to go through. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Lloyd, uh, to, to Rob Lloyd. And, uh, and he is going to be the host for, for our evening. I'm going to make a couple of appearances, but, but really he is the one who has all the work. And, uh, and uh, Rob, take it away. All right, thank you, Michael. And yes, uh, uh, Calder's uh, Entertainment Arts Management Education uh, graduated last year is being put to the test as our show and stage manager for the event. So uh, we're really grateful to have him and that Drexel education powering us today. So um, with that, uh, we want to get our first uh, presenters ready to go. Um, but before, as we bring them in behind the scenes, um, I want you to all enjoy this incredible trailer from our on-campus game incubator, Entrepreneurial Game Studios. And so we have a great trailer coming up. And uh, after that, we're going to get started with our first team right after this video. But here we go for the EGS trailer. Have at it. Many of those EGS games are available on Steam or will be soon, so look out for them or at your local board game store. All right, here we have Cosmic Engine and their project, Dayfarers. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our Senior Project Showcase. We are Cosmic Engine, and today we're here to talk to you about our video game, Dayfarers. Before we get started, we'd like to show you a quick introductory trailer. In Vivarium, you always start out with four characters, one of each species, and a fourth of a random species.
right. First, let's introduce the team. Cosmic Engine is a 12-person team with six Dega members. Hi, I'm Kate Bird, and I was the producer on Cosmic Engine. I'm Rex Christian. I'm a game artist. I'm Mira Hollihan. I'm a 2D artist. I'm Ryan Kelly, and I'm a 3D artist. I'm Lisa Marola. I'm the art lead. And I'm Griffin Robbins, and I'm a tech artist. We also have six CCI members, some of whom are in the audience. We're advised by Professor Stefan Ronk and Professor Jeff Salvage, and we'd like to extend a special thanks to Julie McLaughlin, our amazing sound designer. Day Ferris is a turn-based combat strategy game where the player must outmaneuver brutal opponents by utilizing time travel and to turn the tides of battle. When the battle gets tough, travel through the turns you've taken and use your new knowledge of the future. With different timelines and unique character abilities, you can be any foe that stands in your way. As you saw in our opening cinematic, our heroes Etra, Tim, and Bell are out to defeat all three crook bosses, the thief, the cheat, and the liar, in order to reclaim the stolen stabilizers and free Tim's grandpa. Each of our bosses have their own unique abilities, attack patterns, and environment, and we took our time to make sure the design of each boss reflected their unique styles. The game follows a non-linear design, and players get to pick who they fight and when, beat all three bosses to win the game. Day Fairies is a turn-based combat game where the player controls the three main characters, Bell, the healer, Tim, the mage, and Etra, the tank. From the battle HUD, you will manage most of the game by monitoring your character status, choosing your actions, and reviewing the battle lock. Each character has a series of individualized abilities relating to their role. This offers the player the chance to change up their playstyle as they go. All moves cost action points, and the more powerful the move, the higher the cost. It is up to the player to best make use of these actions. Each character's health and action points are displayed on the heads-up display at all times for the player to reference. Each round, characters get their own turn to take an action. The player picks the action of each character, and then all actions are performed together at the end of the round. The results of each action are then recorded in the time tree for the player to keep track of. Selecting different moves makes for different combos. The player interacts with time through the use of the time tree. This feature provides the player with a blueprint of the entire battle, showing every action made by both the players and the enemies, and the consequences of those actions. By toggling the time travel button at any time, you can bring it up for reference. The time tree can grow without constraint, so the player is not limited to the number of actions they can choose to take. As time travel is the center focus of Dayfarers, the refinement of the time tree was a primary concern of ours. It underwent the, lar it underwent the largest number of changes of any feature throughout our development, and we ended up with a comprehensive ground-based system. Our goal was to provide the player with enough flexibility and information to make rapid, informed decisions without overwhelming them. As the player progresses throughout the encounter, the time tree will continue to grow until the player has an elaborate blueprint of the entire battle. You only have to get one winning branch to take down a big bad. After the player chooses to time travel to the beginning of a round that they have already taken, the enemy's action indicator will be filled in, as the player has experienced this turn before. By knowing exactly what the enemy will do and who their target will be, the player is able to rethink their strategy and adapt their gameplay accordingly. Once the player changes what actions their characters will perform, the timeline branches and the next round will have a new enemy attack that is changed from the original timeline. Another primary goal for the team was to create special moves that worked in tandem with our time travel feature. Dayfarers has a number of moves that encourage adaptive gameplay, but certain moves, like Tim's counter, shown on screen, specifically require knowledge if the player can only achieve through an iterative playstyle. Counter is a powerful but expensive ability that is able to redirect an attack on a team member back at its caster, but only if the player is able to correctly predict who the attack will land on. By taking advantage of time travel, the player gains the upper hand here and can redirect a powerful attack away from the wounded Vel and back onto the dastardly cheater. Along with the standard health resource, each character is also limited by the amount of action points or AP that they have. If the player runs low, they will need to replenish these stats by drawing them into the current turn from another existing turn on the time tree. As we worked to increase the strategic difficulty of the game, we decided to take this limited resource approach to the main stats. If the player is able to properly branch the time tree, they should be able to create a reserve of resources that they can draw from when they're in need. Beyond the moves themselves, there are various effects that each move can apply. There are three negative status effects in the game and three positive ones. 
and it is up to the player to decide how they want to combine all the abilities of their three characters to best match each foe. We made sure to include a comprehensive reference guide for the player to check whenever they need some help. By combining all of the different techniques and building upon all of the information available, each player is able to draft their own path to victory through the boss battles. Dayfarers has a lot for the player to learn, but by going slowly and steadily through each battle, we hope to have created an engaging experience with a fulfilling conclusion. Thank you all so much for your time today. We'd like to especially thank our fantastic advisors, Professor Stefan Ronk and Professor Jeff Salvage, as well as everyone who has playtested Dayfarers over the past nine months. For more information or to play our game, check us out online at cosmic-engine.gitlab.io or scan the image on your screen with your smartphone. We hope you enjoy our game. What a great game. What a great presentation. Uh, let's, let's give a virtual cheer. <laughs> And it's now a great pleasure for me to introduce you to uh, Dan Fernancy, uh, who is going to lead the, the chat. Uh, Dan uh, has uh, graduated from the digital media program in 2011. He is the owner and the director of Dan Fernancy uh, LLC and Ether Studios. And he was listed as one of the 30 most influential people in game design under 30. So, so that, that's a big thing. So Dan, take it away. Yeah, uh, nice to meet all you guys. Uh, first of all, congrats on your senior project and uh, you know graduating from the program. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I graduated in 2011, but I do still remember my senior project. So I'm really impressed at the level of polish that you guys were able to, to achieve. Um, I know we spent a long time just trying to figure out what we were doing. So you know, by the end, we're still doing core features. We weren't really like <laughs> making sure everything looked nice. Um, so yeah, I'm really impressed at the design. It looks like you guys did a great job coming together to kind of come up with like a unique mechanic and a unique world that were cohesive. That's like a big thing that we try to do um, at Ether Studios. It's like all our games are set in like the same universe. Um, so we really try to make sure mechanics and like the story line up. So it was really cool to see like the clock on the um, axe and the kind of details that like tie the time travel into the game's world. Um, yeah, and then I'm trying to think, I'm just really impressed with you guys. I think, is it uh, for a question for Rob, are you guys gonna ask me questions or do you just want? So, you know, I think one of the things that they talked about in their presentation, and I definitely, I hounded them nonstop uh, during this production is trying to figure out how to balance the time, the use of the time loop and make it actually not just in the very beginning. I remember, you know, uh, Kate, maybe you can talk to uh, the challenges you had in your play testers at first didn't even know the time tree existed. And then how do you get to the point where, it really became critical because that balancing and that fighting aspect and balancing the, all the, the fighting aspects and the parameters of that was really tough. So. I would love to talk about that for a minute because it also ties into how we managed to make our characters and our environment tie in thematically is we always knew we wanted to do a time travel based game. So like from our earliest prototype, we had time travel in, but to make it really engaging and fun for the player to use, we had to go through a lot of iterations. So sort of the central focus for the entire team became time travel everywhere from the UI to the characters, to the environment. We wanted just it always on the mind of the player. We wanted it to be aesthetically appealing and we wanted it to be mechanically appealing. Yeah, and the, I mean, I think one of the things that I was sort of particularly excited about having Dan be in the conversation with you was that one of the things that Rivals of Ether is known for is the balancing. And you guys had such a challenge with that. So um, getting, getting the costs of the moves and attack points and HP and all that, getting that balanced across your characters. For sure. And I'd really like to give a shout out to our CCI lead, Jacob Branson. It was his idea to incorporate the turn indicator, which is when the enemies move and target appears above their head if you time travel to a turn that's already existed, as well as the limited resource approach to our HP and AP pools. Those were both his ideas, and they really 
helped with the um, focus on time travel because they just continued to give the players more and more reasons to interact with this feature. Nice, yeah, I guess that question for you guys was, um, so like I said, compared to us, we didn't really know what we were doing um, early enough. Uh, when did you guys start getting play testers in? Like when did you have a build that you were able to kind of give people and get feedback? Full play testing, we were actually a little bit delayed on. Like we had the play testing builds for a little bit in fall term and a little bit in winter term as per deliverables for the program. But like Rob said, getting the time travel to a state where it was fun enough for the player to give us feedback on other parts of the game was something that really didn't come until spring quarter. Nice. Um, yeah, if I may add to that, we had a joke about how we're going to cut time travel because it was such a constant feedback to us that we need to, you know, really prove that it's relevant. So we actually have a, um, a Discord emote just for that uh, purpose. So I'm really happy with where we got <laughs> in comparison <laughs> to where we started. And um, a big shout out to the team for, you know, the final product. So I, yeah really happy with what we have. Nice, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've experienced that um, myself, like where you have a core idea and it's just not working, but at the same time you have to realize like this is, you know, if it's core to you, then that's what, it's really good, especially your guys' designers kind of sticking to uh, your guns, like that will happen out in the industry where, you know, something that is, um, but what you consider like the basis um, is really important and it goes back to like your design pillars. Um, I guess my question for your team would be, what drew you to time travel in the first place? Was it you came in with that idea or did you kind of start exploring mechanics and then you got drawn to time travel? Uh, I could speak a bit to that. Uh, when um, the, the core idea of this game actually came from our CCI lead, uh, Jake Ranson. And from the beginning, there was this idea of using time travel as a way to turn uh, like turn-based fighting into more of like a strategy and planning situation where uh, you could learn about the fight that's going to happen and then go back and be able to act on that new information. And that was kind of the core idea uh, of the game from the very, very early stages. And I think that's why we were able to do so well with our designs and such is because we had that core idea really early on. Uh, yeah, and to add to that, Lisa had some great concept art at the start where we got to play around with the idea of like, if time travel exists in this universe, then what can we do with our backgrounds? And um, at the very beginning, we thought of like adding different buildings from different times and we kind of worked off that concept to get to where we are now. But that's also where a lot of the themes come from is like, what kind of uh, community or society would exist with time travel. And I think uh, beyond that, we, we had this concept of like going back in time and using that in the strategy. But one of the biggest criticisms was that that's, that's just save scumming, which is essentially the idea that, you know, you save a game uh, and then if you don't like how it happened, you reload it and play it again, which is, not new to games and it's uh, not that exciting. And so we had to sort of fight this, this concept um, that was the oversimplified version of what we were hoping to achieve and see how we can make that more and more complicated and interesting. I want to add the iteration process on that was pretty hilarious too. Like every single play test we'd have, well, they didn't even realize time travel existed because they steamrolled the game without using it. And then we'd have, well, it's impossible to beat without time travel, and that's a complaint. And, you know, every last thing, we'd have to somehow tweak time travel to make sure it fit in and wasn't either obstructive or invisible. Nice. All right, yeah, so one last uh, question for you guys is, um, so anytime when we make a game, there's a lot of times where ideas are spinning around. We have such cool ideas, but unfortunately, you have to finish it. So do you guys have any cool ideas that you had to cut from the game in order to uh, finish it? I can speak on this. Um, so when the game was actually originally pitched to us um, by our CCI lead, it was actually supposed to be this 
open world game uh, with combat encounters and these three, um, I believe it was three, different storylines that would occur throughout the entire game. Uh, and what we soon realized was that that was way too much. Um, and so we kind of continued to whittle it down little by little um, until we got down to the three battles. And then from there, we had to determine what we wanted to do with those three battles and why those three battles were important to us. So much went into this project and so much could have kept on going in. And this has the flavor to me of a project that has life past senior project. We'll see after you guys get a good night's sleep and uh, has a, have a chance to sort of recover from all of this um and uh, see where it goes from there i want to thank all of you for a great uh for a great pr presentation a great year of work uh dan thank you so much for joining us for this i really appreciate it um we have so much more to go through and we have to keep the 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 time marches on um and so thank you again everyone um but i before we move on to our next team i want to take a, a quick look at some incredible uh samples from the animation and visual effects program and uh, we're going to throw to that and then we're going to get our next team ready to go but thank you so much and here comes our animation demo reel Our short light years apart. There we go. Space Jam, take it. it away. Hi, everyone. Today we're presenting our short light years apart.
We made it, Dad. Thank you. Hello, we are Team Space Camp. Our core team is the eight seniors you see here with additional team members taking on roles of our composer and sound designer and production assistant. We've all gathered our strongest sides to put together our short, so please join us on a trip down memory lane of how this story was made. The creation of Light Years Apart started fall term of our junior year. We collectively agreed on sci-fi as our genre. From there, we came up with the core of our story, an astronaut leaves his daughter to find a new Earth. We met every week throughout our junior year to refine our idea with storyboards, concept art, and illustrations. Through these revisions, we found our emotional core. We were making a story about love, duty, and hope. It took a lot of iterations to capture that feeling, but by the end of the summer, we were confidently able to switch from our 2D storyboards to a 3D animatic. We didn't stop refining our story until the end of spring term as we wanted to polish the emotional impact. Meet our protagonist, Wen. His design needed to combine two very important aspects. He had to be both an astronaut and a dad. We actually looked to our own parental figures to nail the look. It took quite a bit of iterations to get the face down just to get just that proper dad astronaut countenance. We integrated body capture at the 3D animatic stage and worked with the story team to polish and reshoot any data that was missing. After the body movement was locked in, we shot the face separately so that we had less data to process. Due to COVID restrictions, our shoots were limited to two people in the space to ensure everyone's safety. Because we were using performance capture, we, will we were able to iterate very quickly for the 3D pre-visualization pre pre without major time loss when a new rig was integrated. The rig itself had to be custom edited to be mocap compatible. We followed in the footsteps of a senior project from last year to create a full performance capture pipeline. The two sections of the ship were made to reflect the main conflict of the short. While the cockpit is, cockpit is indicative of Wen's dedication to his job and mission, the living quarters represent his love for his daughter, Daisy. For the exterior environments, we had to create a unique approach because of the organic nature of the environment. To simulate this, we used a variety of techniques such as instancing, dynamic simulations, and procedural models to create the asteroid belt, the planet, and the flower field. All of this, in the end, hinged on our production management. We had an extensive folder and spreadsheet structure that helped keep track of all the moving parts. We've also used a flexible production pipeline that allowed rapid iteration over the course of the project. In the end, we've gone through over 80 versions of our short, 10 versions of the shot list, 50 critiques, and over three terabytes of data. If you're interested in learning more about the making of Light Years Apart and Team Space Camp, please visit our Instagram page. Here you can see both our successes and hilarious mishaps while making the show. We're extremely thankful to our advisors at Drexel Lady, Nick, and Dave, as well as Josh Lebrot, who have all helped us shape the story into what it is now. We could not have done it without your feedback. And thank you to everyone who has followed us on this journey. Yay! <laughs> Wow, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I continue to be impressed by how, how much our students can actually kind of do in this short amount of time. But I'm not going to be the one who is going to bubble along here. Uh, in, in our chat now, we have Simon Littlejohn. He graduated from the master program in 2012, and he is currently FX supervisor at Zoic Studios. Uh, Simon. Hey, everyone. Hey, Hi. Thanks oh. for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I will say, 
this being the first time I've been able to actually view the project, I thought it was awesome. <laughs> it was it was really really good. I'm impressed at the uh, basically from from start to finish. Um, it really did not seem like you guys cut corners. Everything just looked really well um, shot, well lit, well animated. Uh, you had a lot of just tiny bits of detail that I thought were that it just like brought me into uh, the world. Uh, the set design was great. Just pretty much. <laughs> I, I have nothing but good things to say about that. It, it was really, really good. Thank you so much. It was a long um, way in the making. I, I absolutely believe that, having <laughs> having been a part of the program. I, I know the uh, the hurdles that I'm sure you guys had to leap in order to get to this final uh, render. I guess one of the first uh, questions I have, because there's a lot of really uh, intricate shots in that, what would you say the hardest or I guess most time extensive sequence was for that short? Uh, I guess in terms of like rendering and just um, from concept to actually getting it out and viewable. I think Jenks can take that question. I think you know which shot I'm thinking about. Yeah, so we have a lot of uh, long shots and the longest shot by far in our short is uh, the shot of when waking up and revealing the planet. Uh, that was a very complex shot that had like not only a pan out, but it also uh, like panned out and revealed the whole environment. So not only was it a complex camera movement, but it was also the introduction of the planet and the planet had a lot of sand on it. So in order to instance all those particles, we had to like divvy up the renders and we had a bunch of render passes that we all had to compile at once. So render time, all those different passes definitely took the longest. And it was also it going, oh, sorry. so sorry, I just Go wanted to ahead. add, it, it was going through from one environment to another environment. And the trick was that the first environment was fully Maya uh, rendered and generated in the interior of the ship. The exterior was half Maya, the ship was rendered out of Maya and half Houdini because it was sand and all the effects. So I think in total, there was like seven or eight different passes and programs, different renders that were independent of each other, rendered completely separately, and then put together in common. That's awesome. Yeah, I noticed, and I, I don't want to get too technical for the people who are watching this, but I did notice what I assumed to be a lot of pop grain action going on with the foot interaction of the sand, or maybe it was just particles, not sure, but it, it looked great. Uh, it was a great touch. Um, another thing that happened to me <laughs> plenty of times while working on shorts at Drexel is that um, I would have <laughs> some pretty catastrophic failures in my, uh, in my rigs or my lighting setups. And one thing that I noticed uh, is your, your main character uh, is very well designed, uh, very professionally done. I, I thought it was great. It, it was just perfect proportions for what I would expect to be a space dad. Uh, I think you guys nailed it. Did you have any sort of hurdles when rigging that character? Because it seemed pretty complex. Uh, and I also noticed, I believe there might have been some cloths in done on him as well. Um, but w what were the hurdles, I guess, in getting that character uh, <laughs> good to go and not actually exploding like I've had <laughs> with anything I've made? Shannon, yours, you're the rigger. <laughs> well, uh, honestly, I would say that the biggest hurdle, especially in the beginning, was the fact that no one on our team is a rigger, and nor did anyone really want to be. So <laughs> since I was kind of on the mocap side, and I knew what I needed for, um, for the mocap to be able to work really nicely with the rig, it was kind of laid on me. So uh, <laughs> the biggest hurdle was, one, figuring out who actually wanted to do it, and then two, trying to figure out how to get the motion capture to drive everything, but also make it animator friendly enough that if we need like a hand to go just a little bit further, we could push that and uh, you know give it that kind of flexibility. Yeah, since we had to take it through the whole performance capture, it involved the face capture, the body capture, it had to be compatible, it had to be animatable without the motion capture. So it was like a very complex thing and we totally owe it to, to Shannon and Alex for figuring that out. Oh, you guys you nailed guys, it. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I, I second that, Simon. And uh, an incredible project. 
and really well done. And uh, from start to finish, um, it's been a pleasure to watch this pr uh, project progress on your social media feed and how quickly you got down such a rich level of detail and world building, um, really beautifully done and a lovely film. So thank you all. Thank you, Simon, for joining us so much. I really appreciate your time. We all do. Um, and, Can I uh, say one, one sure. word? I unfortunately misnamed one of our team members. Members, it's Ara. Just wanted to clarify that so nobody gets confused. Just wanted to do Hi, due Ara. diligence. She's fantastic. <laughs> and yeah, thank you so much. Is. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. It was great chatting with you. My pleasure. Thank you all. And from here, uh, we're going to move on to our next team. But before we do, I want you all to enjoy this unusual video of game program projects that uh, the game program, the VR animators, everybody within the digital media community have worked on over the last few years, where they are projects that are beyond the desktop and on very odd alternative platforms. And with that, I want to play that. And thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for having us. I love that all those crazy platforms that are used in that video and all the crazy projects and unusual things that Drexel students have done. But right now, uh, we want to celebrate our interactive digital media seniors and their project, AFA. Hello, everyone. Today, we'll showcase AFA, a web application that we created to ensure that all of our families' memories can be viewed easily and always remembered for many years to come. Hello, I'm Arpit, and I work on the research and design. Hi, I'm Fidel. I worked on design and development. I'm Brianna. I worked on research and design. Hi, I'm Eric, and I worked on development. Hello, and I am Ben, the project manager, and we are the interactive digital media team advised by Phil Sinatra. For many people, family is the most important thing in the world. Families are the compass that guides us. They are our inspiration to reach great heights and our comfort when we occasionally falter. We need to cherish the memories we have with these people and the people we have in them and the future we also have with those people. The past year has been challenging and straining on everyone here. The ongoing pandemic and repeated lockdowns have forced each of us to miss out on things and those that we cherish. For many, this forced separation from their families has been taxing and we are only now just beginning to see the end. Things like birthdays, holidays, family gatherings, and vacations all had to be canceled, downsized, or postponed. Everything we did together had to be virtualized. AFEA is a digital platform that enables families to share memories and group them into collaborative albums. 
This ensures that all family memories can be easily accessed and stored for years to come. Our team was inspired by the ways families in Africa lived. We learned that in most African homes, the entire extended family lives together. This enhances the sense of community and connection within a family. The word efie comes from the tree word efie, and it means home. We chose that as our name because we wanted to reflect that meaning in our platform. Now, please enjoy our promotional video. Your family tree grows at your own pace with you and your family. Include your children, deceased loved ones, and even your pets to always make sure that your loved ones are kept close. Set up a family member's profile ahead of time to set a spot for them in AFA. Then, then they could join the tree in progress and see all the albums and memories that have been cre created so far. And don't worry if there's any typos on a profile. You'll be able to change it whenever you want. The core of the AFA experience that we developed is being able to share important memories with your family. AFA is just for those important memories, filtering out all the noise. This makes it easy for you and your family to find the milestones and events in each other's lives. These memory, in these memories, you're able to add photos, tag your family, and store them in a single place where your family can view them whenever they want. On AFA, albums allow you and your family to group your memories in ways that make sense to you. As a parent, you tend to hoard all your memories that you've collected over the years, be it of your children's birthdays or graduations, or even uneventful but special days that turn into memories. With AFA, you can do that with ease, and the only thing that matters is what matters to you. Both memories and albums are designed to be organic. We've all missed out on that one picture that sparks the special moment you forgot about and should have made the album. That's why we've designed memories and albums to always be editable so you can go back and update or even remove media from them. And we'll make sure you never lose those special memories ever again. During our research for FEA, we identified a design opportunity in family networking. We noticed that popular digital platforms didn't provide enough privacy and were just too distracting for families to be intimate with each other. On the other hand, certain sites focus too much on the historical aspects of family. Our users wanted a simple digital space to share memories and stay connected with their loved ones. Our challenge was to design a digital experience where families can connect and support our users in reaching their goals. We spent months researching with a user-centric, reiterative design approach, interviewing your users virtually as well, which was a fun new experience, and ensuring that they got exactly what they desired and more. We started out developing wireframes and building out our own design system with an atomic design approach. We filtered through hundreds of fonts, colors, assets, and developed a unique identity that matches our solution. Our wireframes and design system allowed us to rapidly build out high fidelity prototypes and transition into front-end development. Our iterations with users helped us design AFIA to be an accessible, versatile, and vibrant experience for all users. Development was no walk in the park either. From the start of the project, we knew we wanted to challenge and expand upon what we have learned in web development. We knew we wanted to build a web application that would allow for multiple users to be using it at once, and would also highlight the connections between those users. 
doing research, we decided that Node.js was the optimal web framework that would allow us to do server-side development while allowing us to easily build out the features that we wanted. We also discovered Neo4j, which is a database technology quite literally built around connections. It was the absolute perfect fit for what we wanted to accomplish here. And we also leveraged MongoDB to handle our normal data models. These three technologies together, we had very little experience with directly prior to starting this project. However, based on the foundations we learned in our interactive digital media classes, we were able to jump right in and utilize these to their fullest potential. Things like SAS and GitHub were technologies we're already very familiar with, but this is our first time working in a team this large on a project of this scale. So using both those systems at this size made a very interesting challenge for us as developers. All of our blood, sweat, and tears got us here to the finish line today. And we wouldn't have gotten here without the support of our family and friends who have been motivating us um, every step of the way. We also want to give a shout out to Amira Hollihan, who created the original illustrations for our project. You can check out her work today on Project Day Fairs. We also want to thank our advisor, Phil, who advised our team and for keeping a bonfire under our butts at all times. Check us out and create your own family tree today at FBA.io. Join the ever-growing community of users on FBA and get your family to join your tree. Add memories and start sharing what is important to you and your family. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yay, uh, great project, great presentation. Um, many people don't know about the interactive digital media program. Some people call this the best kept secret of the digital media department. Uh, many of our alumni have been extremely extraordinary successful. It's our user experience design program. And, uh, and I'm therefore very, very happy to introduce another heavyweight to the to the chat discussion. Uh, Dan Moore, he is he graduated in 2006. And he is the uh, um, owner and the founder and CEO of super friendly. Then, Hi, everybody. Thanks for that introduction. Wow, what a great project. There's a lot of work that you all have done. I hope you all are very proud, and I hope that you have a chance to take a deep breath and relax after a ton of work there. I have a couple of questions. I think one of the great things about this format is that we get to ask you questions that we might not be able to get just by the case study and by looking at the website. So I'm going to ask you a couple of behind-the-scenes questions, if, if that's all right with all of you. Uh, first thing is that I think that good work is, is personal. Um, maybe you all can share a little bit of what was personal to you about this project, why you decided to make an app around connections and around family. What were some of the things that maybe you all have, have thought that this would be a good app for you and, and your families to use? Uh, I can go ahead and start with that. I myself have spent nearly the entirety of the pandemic away from my family. Uh, I've been several states away. I've spent time in Pennsylvania, also New Jersey, but my family's up in Massachusetts. So the idea of missing out on all these important things that they're going through up back at home really kind of hit home for me. And I really felt that as we were starting to ideate and create this project. I can also share something. I'm an international student from Ghana, and I haven't seen my family in maybe over a year. So when this, you know, opportunity came about, I said, why don't we explore something like this so that we can, you know, build the connections that we have back at home and stay in touch with our entire families. What a, uh, what a great, oh yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, if I could add, I also have had, um, the unfortunate experiences of like missing out baby showers, weddings. Um, my family's going to miss out on graduation, uh, my graduation. And I wanted to create a solution where even though they could not be there physically, they could be there with me and I could be with them. It's so great to see you all working on such a timely project in a time when the world is more disconnected maybe than, than we have been, especially this last year. It's great to see a group of students like really taking something on that allows people to connect better uh, in, a, in a way that we're disconnected. So that's really awesome that you all have done a project like this. Um, one of the things that I love about doing interactive design and UX design is the idea that you get to put some, you get to make some assumptions 
And some of those you're right about and some of those you're wrong about. And you find out about that in user testing and usability testing. You find out about that in interviews where there's some things that maybe you all had assumed upfront in your project. And then once you did some testing and started talking to people about it, you maybe learned some, something different that made you take the project in a different direction than you anticipated. I'll pass that off to Arpit or Ben, who worked on a lot of our user research. Yeah, um, I think, uh, as you said, we it's a continuous reiterative approach. And during our testing, we did find users wanting um, options or avenues that we originally didn't plan for or had planned otherwise. I think the biggest feature that we wanted not to focus on was chat because uh, initially, we did have the thought of having our app kind of like something which can have more inclusion between family members, but then we realized that we might be mimicking something a lot of other social media apps are already doing. And that's something that our testing really showed that users definitely did not want. And I think it helped really help cater this niche experience of families just being connected to each other and just sharing the important memories. And we like to keep it at that. Yeah, and um, going off a little bit about that on the social media aspect, uh, we wanted to make sure basically from the beginning that we didn't want to be another social media app. We, we're not here as a replacement to social media. We're just kind of here as, as our pit said, we want to create an avenue so that families are able to stay connected, especially as we know in this very isolated time that we're all in. And if I could add one more thing, intimacy and privacy was definitely one of the top things we found out. A lot of the families realized on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything is just kind of out there and out of their control. They wanted to have something that was more intimate and personal. And if he is one of the products that's able to give them that service and experience. Awesome. My last question then for you all is maybe you can hear from one or two of you. Um, you all probably learned a bunch of things during this project. What are some things that you might take away from this project that you're going to take into whatever your next star, next steps are, whether that's entering the field professionally, going to grad school, whatever it is that you're going to do next. What are some things that you learned from senior project that you're going to take away with you? For me, it was the importance of being familiar with as many different web technologies out there because there are thousands of active things out there that are being used and knowing just what's right and being able to research that I think is a huge skill that definitely needs to be focused more on as you're learning web development. It's not just about how to write the code or what makes something go. It's about how to find out what works best. Awesome. I love this project and the evolution that it has gone through from the initial confusions that people thought, oh, is it going to be this? Is it going to be this? And now you guys were really forced to really define it, find that focus and really stay on that track. And you've done it admirably well, really well done. Dan, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. I really appreciate it. Um, I've got to keep this train moving forward. Um, and so I do want to keep the uh, interactive digital media vibe going because we're, we're before our next team, we're going to throw to a video about an interactive digital media junior workshop project, homies, as well as the Drexel uh, Student Club uh, CHI. And uh, with that, I want to throw to that video. But thank you all so much for being here in uh, FEA. Really good job. Congratulations. And thanks again, Dan. <laughs> All right, I gotta take out the trash today. All right, here we go. I'm just gonna drop this icky bag right here. Perfect. Now let me just die. Yes, great. Let's see how our overall progress for the month has been so far. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the least amount of effort in this house. Okay, that's not fair for my roomies. Let me, let me take them some more responsibilities. Clean stove, I can definitely do that. Alright, look at that. Shiny, shiny, and clean. Wait a minute. That's been there for a while now. I got work to do, so I can't do it right now, but I gotta let my roommate know because this dish needs to be taken care of. 
Let's have it done by tomorrow, Lee, for anyone to do. Perfect, set. Alright, it's out there for grabs. Wait, did somebody already... Michaela! Wow, she completed the task already. I appreciate you, Michaela. Honestly, thanks to homies, living with roommates has never been easier. Moving on from interactive digital media, uh, we now bring you Team Mimzo from the animation group and the fabulous story of Mimzo. Hello, yes, we are Team Mimzo. We are so excited to present our short film, um, The Fabulous Story of Mimzo. So we hope you enjoy.
Hello everyone. Uh, the Fabulous Story of Mimzo is a 3D animated adaptation of Neil Prayer's illustrated book. The story follows the journey of Mimzo, a mysterious creature who finds himself lost in the winter mountains in search of belonging. Yeah, we are Team Mimzo, so we consist of all animation uh, seniors, and we consist of Brett, Kate, Forrest, Cheska, Julie, and myself. And I want to give a special shout out to Kweku, who created our original music score as well. So to capture the essence and of loneliness and isolation, we decided to look to the original story as much as we could. Um, and so we used a black and white color scheme with select coloring. We did this in addition to using the MNPRX watercolor stylization rendering effect. This led to many unique lighting challenges with limited lighting tools due to viewport rendering techniques, set extension techniques with fog, and many, many layers in comp. In terms of the environment, most of it was made in Houdini with procedural workflows and then taken into ZBrush and Substance for sculpting and texturing work. Since N the NPRX renderer does not allow for displacement or bump maps, all the details in the geometry itself. As for Mimzo's effects, we want him to be magical and out of this world, but not so, but not look so different compared to the other characters, so he still belongs in the same universe. After a lot of tests, we landed on this displacement effect that we call his ripple, which requires masking out of his eyes and limbs. And lastly, in important, in important shots where Mimzo is caught in the light of the hole in the sky, his body populates with stars, foreshadowing the home he was in search for. Yeah, so one of the challenges we faced when starting out was finding the best way to actually go about rigging Mimzo. We wanted to keep his original shape and his classic proportions from the book, but we also wanted the rig to have enough flexibility for animation as well. But after a good amount of research and testing, we were able to find a really good solution. Mimzo is made up of eight individually rigged meshes, those being his body, his arms, his legs, eyes, and scarf. By utilizing normal constraints and geometry constraints, Mimzo's arms, legs, and eyes are capable of moving freely across his whole entire body. To hide the fact that these are all separate pieces, though, skin wrap deformers were used to seamlessly blend where his limbs meet his body. The textures achieved on the chipmunk and owl were, were created in Substance Painter. We wanted to create a painterly look to allow cohesion with the watercolor render effect. To do this, we use a bump map information to drive the sculpt that drove the brush. This allowed us, allows us to get the fur and feathers to look three-dimensional on the flat surface. The chipmunk is a quadruped, which was a challenge we had not encountered until this project. Through the study of rodent anatomy, we are able to achieve its mobility. Some highlighted features of this rig include a joint chain spine. This technique allows the model's geometry to squash and stretch. This practice is used in the tail as well for flexibility and functionality. Also, the rig contains both IK and FK controls, which allows easy um, accessibility for the animators to get a wide range of motion. This was our first time modeling and rigging something with wings, so it was definitely another one of our biggest challenges. As for the model, we were going for a playful style with softer features and an overall rounder shape. As for the rig, the head, body, and legs are rigged similarly to a human with blend shapes controlling the facial expressions and joints at each bend and along the spine. The wings are where a lot of trial and error came into play. The wing bones are rigged like human arms with joints at each bend, and the feathers are separate meshes that are constrained to the bone and can be deformed to show movement like air drag. The feathers can also be freely moved to offer a lot of flexibility in their placement, like when the owl folds in its wings. So thank you all so much for tuning in. We really all love this story and enjoyed um, the creation of it. So we wanted to thank our advisors, Milady, Dave, and Nick, our friends and family for all your love and support, and especially Niels Prayer, who wrote this beautiful story and created Mimzo. So thank you all so much. Ooh, uh, I have to say, I've never seen so many clapping hands emoji in the chat before. Uh, 
that that was that was something um and i'm quite frankly also running out of superlatives when it comes to our alumni so uh in in the chat with us now is evan boucher he is he actually graded from from the uh master program in 2010 and he is lead uh character technical director at dreamworks animation evan hello hello evan thanks for joining us no problem Good to be here. Congrats, everybody, on the job well done. That's a lot of work in there. And, you know, congrats on this wonderful day where you guys can be done and have a nice, you know, breath of fresh air, I'm sure. So it's great to see uh, um, a character like Mimzo sort of come through. But I personally, I'm a big fan of the owl. Owl legs are just so enchanting. Um, but uh, no, I love the watercolor aspect of this, um, everything. You tied it together really well. But the animating of that sort of blobby character and the specialties that you had to sort of go with that. I know that, Evan, that's a lot of what you've dealt with is the rigging of, of you know, I've, I've seen your demo reel many times and all, as it's evolved over the years. Oh, yeah. Like, um, first off, I just want to say the production design is great on this, like, what you guys were able to achieve, I think it was really smart to go with the graphic sort of black and white look with the little red highlights. It's like some of those frames could easily be paintings and um, they're, it's very, very beautiful. Um, and yeah, I think the Mimzo rig is really impressive. It's deceptively simple as I'm sure you guys are all aware since you created it. But like, um, you know, someone watching that might not realize what all goes into that. I, there's a lot of stuff I picked up on there, uh, like the sliding, you know, arm attachment stuff. I've had to do the very same thing with certain characters um, at, at work. And um, yeah, I think it was smart, like kind of masking out the areas with this little ripple effects, like, cause I noticed how like, oh, that's really impressive how, you know, it, the expressions, the very graphic expressions on the eyes don't get muddied or anything like that as this kind of, you know, thing is rippling all over his body and stuff. So. Good job, guys. And I'm sure it was a lot of R&D and testing things out and trial and error, but um, I think you guys adapted to the problems pretty well, too. Also, three characters. That's a lot of characters. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and I guess, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, as kind of Rob was saying, birds, owls, hard stuff to do. Um, I'm curious like to hear more about your process of dealing with the feathers and just like from an animator's perspective, how they control those things. Yeah, um, so for the feathers, they are pretty much just constrained to the wing bone of the owl. Um, and they each have individual controllers that you can move them around pretty much wherever you want to place them. So like it would be really beneficial when the owl folds in its wings, you can kind of keep a separate model that has the exact placement of the feathers that you want, but they are also constrained so that when you bend the wings and like it's flapping and stuff, it has the ability to show air drag um, and things like that. Uh, the feathers have individual joint chains in each of them. And then they all have like their own controllers for the joints. And it's a little more complicated than you would think, but yeah. <laughs> so are you posing feathers individually for every shot or do you also have like some sort of macro controllers to kind of work with them as groups? Um, there are controllers to move them as groups. Like with the air drag, it's pretty much just a couple controllers for um, sections of feathers. And then um, for most of the shots, we did use a separate rig that already had the placement of the feathers as the way we wanted them. Oh, OK, cool. That's cool. Um, all right, well. I could stay here all day and Evan, um, I would love to keep uh, you on the line for these conversations, but unfortunately we still have more projects. There are still more to see. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Evan, so much for being here and for joining us in the conversation today. Congratulations, uh, team Mimzo and what a fabulous story. And one of these days I'll try to figure out how to say it in French, but, um, really well done. Um, 
but we need to keep moving on. And so I'm the harsh taskmaster. Um, I, I want to take us from this project. And before we bring in the next team, uh, Molehill, I want to take a look at a recent uh, upcoming project from Entrepreneurial Game Studio, and also paired with a video from our uh, traditional animation club uh, run by Note, which has got some incredible stuff. Evan, you definitely want to check that video out. Um, and we're going to go to that, and then we'll come back with our next team. Uh, once again, thank you, Evan, and thank you, Team Minjo. Glad to be here. Thanks, guys. Me. Okay. And here we are with Molehill and their project, Uprooted. The start off with our short story is that Martin, a middle-aged flower vendor, must face his fears in order to save the life of a baby Rufus, who mysteriously turned up in his small village. In order to get the baby back home, avoiding a hungry snake, Sidra, who wants to make the baby heart launch, and our intention was to show loving and caring through their adventure. So here's our short uprooted. I hope you enjoy.
that was our shirt. Hi, I'm Melissa Aiken. I was a team lead, character modeler, rigger, uh, and I also did the set dressing in Unreal as well as R&D throughout our whole pipeline from Maya to Unreal. Hi, my name's Ali Spear Digliosi. I was the texture artist, animator, and layout artist. Hi, I'm Mia Kwan, and I was hard surface modeler, storyboard artist, layout artist, and animator. Hi, I'm Devin Riley. I was the concept artist, the storyboard artist, uh, and animator, and I did the lighting in Unreal. So our protagonist is Morton. He's a fatherly mole character. We wanted to give him a warm personality and show through his actions that he's still affected by the loss of his son, but channels that hurt through kindness and sacrifice. Rufus is our flat character. He's a toddler whose situation forces Morton to spring into action. Deidre's a snake and she's the antagonist showing up in Morton's life to eat another unattended child, just like another snake did with his, with his own son, Mylan. Our characters have gone through several iterations of our senior project. We decided, when we decided to have a child be the one that found the mole men, Rufus's design came pretty easy. We always knew how Morton wanted to look, but he did go through a few color changes. And Cedra was a bit more challenging, actually, because I have a crippling phobia of snakes. Uh, so yes, looking at reference for her was not fun. Uh, when drawing the characters, I had to think about how they'd walk and move and try to keep the, sheet, uh, the character sheets consistent. And once we've changed the environment from the glass quarters, we made it look more underground, surrounded by rocks, and represented the market, forest, and tunnel into one. And we created hero assets Maya and combined them with um, assets from Unreal Quixel. And we also regenerated the underground looking textures using Substance Spinner and established the mood with the glowing and sipping lights in a dark space. Thank you. So uh, as in regards to our biggest changes, um, we had a lot of critique based on our environment from fall quarter onwards. Uh, we were told that it didn't really look underground, which we agreed with once it was pointed out to us. And this led to a massive revamp and resulting in what you saw today. Uh, the environment gained a more cohesive look in terms of how they flow into one another. And another large change we made was to the story. We had to cut down some shots for time's sake and due to the amount of people and manpower that we had. The decision-making process boiled down to asking ourselves, like, do we really need this shot or are we just like emotionally attached to it? And this is uh, depicted here are our old environments. So you can see we've come a long way. And then here is a visual representation of the Maya to Unreal pipeline that we so torturously went through throughout this whole process. So we chose to render our project in Unreal for a couple of reasons. Uh, most importantly, we're a small team and we wanted to use all the time we could uh, by doing efficient tasks like animating and fixing rigs in environments and not have to worry about the days and hours it would take to render out our short. We also knew that Unreal was and still is gaining traction in digital media specifically with animation and we wanted to educate ourselves on the newest software. Even though we had staff and colleagues who expressed interest in helping us, the pipeline from Maya to Unreal regarding animation had a really steep learning curve. And throughout the course of the year, we built our knowledge of Unreal from the ground up through reading documentation online, looking up video tutorials, and lots of trial and error. I'm muted again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think we could all agree that this year has been really hard on everyone. In addition to senior project, we all also had to adjust to the pandemic and not being able to get a lot of face-to-face -face communication or team building work time as projects have in the past. Uh, we had to take this mountain and turn it into a molehill. It was also really challenging teaching ourselves a whole new program, Unreal Engine, but it was ultimately a very rewarding experience. And at the end of the day, we were able to overcome and create something that we're proud to share with you all today. And then we would also like to thank the advisors for their feedback. John Avery's for doing the scoring and our friends and family for all the support they've given us. Absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, 
And uh, and with me in the chat, actually, we are sticking to the theme. With me in the chat today uh, is uh, Ross Regan, and he is a production coordinator at DreamWorks Animation. He graduated from digital media in 2014. Ross. Hi, Michael. Hey, team. Great job, everyone. This is the first time I've seen, uh, well, any of the senior projects, really, and they've all been just so good one after the other. Uh, so I was really happy to watch this uh, your short just now. Um, yeah, I, I gotta say, I, uh, I really liked the design. I, when you just explained that you had to redesign the entire environment, I was pretty surprised because it looked, uh, really well constructed and well planned out, uh, that entire, uh, interior cave environment, um, some really cool lighting, um, and design choices in there. Um, so yeah, I guess um, I, I, I see you had a lot of uh, focus on getting into the Unreal Engine. So I think I'll ask about that because it seems like you had the story pretty well conceived in your head when you went into the project, um, or at least, you know, you managed to make it seem that way. So either way, it's a success. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I'll start by asking, do you feel like all the effort that you spent getting into Unreal Engine paid off in the end in terms of uh, not having to, you know, babysit render farms and do all that sort of thing. Definitely. I think it really paid off in terms of like when we were rendering, because if we messed up a shot or if like the placement wasn't right, all we had to do was like shift a character. And then it took like a minute to render each scene. So that really gave us a lot of time and it was a true blessing. Wow. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, so did you, were you able to do any kind of post-processing effects or kind of compositing in engine, or did you still do um, some post-production stuff uh, to the renders in either Premiere or After Effects or whatever after the fact? So we were able to do post-processing or rendering out in um, passes in Unreal that's still getting worked on. Uh, we were able to go in and do our research about that. Um, so everything that you see is directly in camera from Maya to Unreal and then rendered out. The only thing we did do some work on is the flashbacks, which have to be a tone on it. Cool, yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, I know you said it was a very complicated process. I guess I'll ask, is there any one part of the pipeline that was maybe the most uh, difficult one to get right between Maya and Unreal, whether it was rigging or lighting or whatever? All of the above. <laughs> the, the animations, hands down, I think. Importing mm -hmm. and exporting the files. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of very fun uh, images come about trying to get the rigs yeah. in Unreal. Uh, we, also, we originally, oh, sorry. No, you can finish, I'm sorry. We originally started using Skelly meshes and that didn't exactly work. And so we wound up using Alembics, but uh, Alexis can talk more about that. <laughs> you don't yeah, have to, so you don't have to, it's gonna bring up that <laughs> <and it's> <laughs> If anyone wants to know, do not use FBXs in Unreal. Use an Alembic and do what we're not supposed to do, which is select all the faces to apply the texture, bring it in, and apply the texture each time it's in Unreal. So that was the last thing we learned, but it helped to tie everything together and it helped us like finish out uh, everything, getting everything rendered as we needed it to. <laughs> awesome. Do you think that uh, do you think that Unreal is like a viable option for more small teams making animation rather than games going forward? I would say definitely just because of render times. Uh, since we only have four people, we spent a long time like animating and getting things ready. So it, it really, really will save you. Like it basically saves us like a, another quarter. We get to work for like much longer than the other teams. Yeah, I was going to comment on that too. <laughs> yeah, because I, I noticed that uh, your your team is on the smaller side compared to some of the other teams that have presented already. So uh, definitely kudos on the fact that you only have, were a four person team because uh, you know the the end result definitely uh, speaks to your ability to work as a cohesive unit. Um, let's see. I don't know. I don't know how many other Unreal related questions I can come up with in the one when the one minute we have left here, but uh, uh, I get, I just want to say I do really love the character designs. Uh, the mole is a very lovable character, um, and you know I kind of got that his personality vibe just from seeing him, with, even though it's obviously a silent uh, silent story. Uh, 
And then the snake character is also really cool looking. Uh, kind of remind me of uh, the the villain from uh, Emperor's New Groove with the the big she was frill in, in the back. Yeah, I referenced uh, Yzma's uh, cape thing for that. Thank you. Awesome. That was an excellent element. It was really charming animation, a great story. And yeah, it, the lines are blurring. When I was coming up um, and others of my white-haired generation were coming up, the line between animation and uh, game and real time was so clear and distinct. And now you guys are part of the next gen that is blurring that line beyond recognize, you know, you can't recognize that line anymore because where is it? So um, I got to keep this train moving, but I'm so happy uh, that uh, you guys have gotten to this point, survived this process and produced this beautiful film. And thank you for sharing it with us today. And Ross, thank you so much for joining us. And actually, Ross, I'm going to have you stay around because we have one more team we want you to talk to. Um, but before we move on to the next team, I want to take a chance to watch a little video here of some recent graduate work in a VR uh, environmental class project that they were working on, as well as, again, highlight some of the unusual things that we do. And we have our theme park engineering and design club that is built out of students from all across Drexel University, including digital media students, and uh, see some of the things that they're doing. But thank you so much uh, for sharing your short with us today. Uh, and thank you so much, Ross, for sharing your time. But let's check out this thing from the grad program and from TPED. Hi everyone, this is my video walkthrough of my virtual world. So um, I wanted to make a kind of forest hangout where you can hang out with your friends, family, whoever you want. So I originally changed my idea from a forest cafe to the forest hangout. Um, I think I like the forest hangout a lot better. Um, so here is just my little kind of rustic vibe going on. There's heat lamps, there's um, tree stumps for seats and barrels as tables. There's also a little uh, mini bar per se. I also added like string lights across so it can have more of like a outdoor kind of hangout place feel. Um, I also added a, more trees in the back because I wanted the forest to be a little more dense. So, um, the trees really bring everything together, I think. Um, I'm kind of sad that I couldn't add more. I would love to make the forest even more dense, but um, my file was a little too big for that. But um, this is my project. I really had fun making it, and it was really a blast learning all of these tools. And we're back, and we have Team Fighter Robo and their film, Fighter Robo.
Hello, everyone. Um, this is Team Fighter Robo, and our project is Fighter Robo. I'm Nicole Keimer. I was the main 2D animator, um, and I also did a bunch of character concept work. I'm Mari Harwood. I did rigging and modeling, also some animating. Uh, hello, I'm Michael Matulis. I did all of the 3D animating and helped with the 3D modeling. Hi, I'm Boron Zhu. I did storyboarding, lighting, and texturing. Um, so here's a little introduction for our characters. Our goal was to create a 2D, 3D integrated style animation. Our robots are 3D modeled and animated, and our humans are 2D animated. Uh, our characters are Robo, the main character robot, his owner, grandfather, um, his a granddaughter, Ava, uh, and Minutius, the owner of Atlas, the opponent or villain robot. Uh, our story is about Robo who enters a uh, robot tournament and hopes to win money for his sick owner. Here are some shows that inspired our animation. Our original goal was to create a show opener inspired by animator animations such as Cowboy Bebop and Some Light Champloo. As you can probably tell, we changed that idea into a tournament fight and took inspiration from other shows such as Pokemon. Uh, along with changing it from an anime opening to a more normal uh, mini story, uh, there were many scenes and environments that were cut, such uh, many of them were took place before the actual fight happened, such as going in from the first floor up through an elevator, and the elevator is where like the emotional flashback would have happened, uh, seeing the tail end of the last fight, and signing in for the next round. With these cut scenes come some cut minor characters. This round robot was going to be the fighter before Robo, and you would have seen him get smashed by Atlas. Then this rabbit one was at the sign-in table. So here's some of our character concept work. Um, most of the members on our team contributed to at least making one of the characters. Um, but I was the one who refined most of the design so that the 2D characters would fit my art style a lot better um, and were easier for me to animate. And so that the 3D characters would be easier to model. I was the main designer for Robo. Uh, Michael was the original designer for the two villains, uh, Manishis and Atlas. And Borong was the original designer for the granddaughter Ava and the sick grandpa. Um, this is our environment concept art. I drew the main arena, signing room, and hallway. So all those spaces are a part of the same large building owned by Manitius. Um, The arena is on the top floor of the building, and it's his like a uh, private colosseum. Um, so compared to a dirty and old underground arena, there are fancy light and big screens. Um, Robo and Ava will take an elevator to arrive at the sign room and get into the arena via the hallway. Um, and Atlas is undefended champion here, so most of the audience has come to support him. Um, when he destroys other robots, um, the audience will, will cheer for him. Um, and all our environment and uh, uh, 3D robots in our animation uh, in our animation use Arno Tone Shader. Uh, we try to make 3D and 2D character looks um, similar. So we give 3D characters those black lines and flat color. So and um, when we are setting up the light, uh, we also try to avoid to bring too much luster and shadows to the 3D character. 3D characters to make them look too realistic. And for 2D, um, 
we also create create shadows according to the direction of the light source. All right, well, thank you so much for watching. Ooh, uh, great stuff, great stuff. And this time actually I saw a lot of heart emojis in the chat. So if you have any positive comments, put them into the chat. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Um, we are welcoming Ross back. For those of you who have just joined us, Ross is a, a graduate from the Digital Media Program in 2014, and he is production coordinator at DreamWorks Animation. Ross. Hey, Team Fighter Robo, great work. Uh, yeah, I got to say, I I really, I see some people in the chat are really commenting on uh, the 2D and the CG mixture. I thought that was definitely a cool, uh, you know, focal point of your animation. I wasn't, uh, again, I hadn't seen any of these beforehand, so just going into it blind, I was um, pretty pleasantly surprised to see that 2D animation in there along with the 3D animation. Um, and I think both both of those elements came out looking really nice. Um, and I also was going to comment, since you put it in your presentation, um, I did, uh, I definitely picked up on that kind of anime inspired uh, storytelling vibe uh, that you were going for. Yeah, um, That's kind of something that came into my head you know, while I was watching it, even without having seen it beforehand. So um, definitely some really strong uh, storytelling choices put into your project. Um, I guess questions wise, I am curious about the, the kind of the pipeline that you used um, to uh, incorporate the 2D animation uh, into the CG animation. Um, I guess I'll start by asking, um, was that something that you had planned ever since the beginning of your project to have 2D animation added in? Uh, or did that kind of come about after you were coming up with the story? Um. 2D animation is something that we always wanted to incorporate in our senior project. Um, like in the beginning, we just didn't really know how to go about doing it. Um, I remembered I was like trying to brainstorm a whole bunch of ideas. And then I remembered that um, Michael really wanted to do something with robots. So I thought that since most media that like have robot characters, like usually in anime and stuff, um, they'll make the robot characters 3D. So I figured that maybe doing um, something like that, like taking the 3D approach and mixing it with 2D um, would like um, bring in the anime style because um, Brong and Mari also wanted to do something more like anime-esque. So I thought that going with that approach meshed it pretty well. Yeah. And now that you mentioned it, yeah, there, there's, I mean, for a long time, there have been um, plenty of 2D animated shows, you know, big budget shows that use lots of uh, CG hidden as 2D animation, you know, lots of anime comes to mind and then other stuff like Futurama um, and other shows definitely lean into that um, using 3D animation disguised as 2D animation. Um, so I think that is a really cool uh, approach to take with it. Uh, out of curiosity, what what uh, technique did you use to create the 2D animation? Was it any specific software or that you had to learn or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I did all the animation in um, Adobe Animate. It was my first time using the program. So I did face like a lot of complications, like figuring out the shading was really annoying because there were no like tutorials or anything on how to do it. But um, I managed to figure out a method that was easy. Um, when integrating the 2D with the 3D, that was also kind of a challenge for some of the scenes, like um, scenes that had both Robo and Ava. I needed to have the 3D renders done before I could like actually animate it. Um, because Adobe Animate does have a feature where you can t put in video, but um, like, the syncing isn't very good. So when you export it, um, like it's all wonky. So like you need the exact frames to have the animation match up. Cool. So were, so was your team, uh, were you working up to the last second to kind of get that put together or did you have some time before the project was due to be able to just sit down and edit the whole thing as, a, as an entire piece of footage? 
I was pretty much working on animation until pretty much the last second. Um, Cause I was waiting on some scenes and then when I got them, I had to clean up what I already had and it took a while, but we managed. <laughs> yeah, it definitely came together. Um, yeah, I, I really like the character designs, both the robots and the humans. Um, I think, um, if, uh, here's a question if, just for the whole team. Was there any specific part of 3D animation um, that you, you know, that you had to overcome as a challenge, uh, whether it was like the rigging or the facial animation of the, of the robot or anything like that that you want to comment on? Uh, rigging was a difficult part, but we managed to get through, get through with that. Uh, in terms of animating the the biggest challenge I, that I had was uh, getting the walk cycle to look good. <laughs> it's always a pain. But you guys pulled it off, and I love the combination of 2D and 3D, and you know that all of these, so many new challenges were taken on by senior teams, and you really, uh, the, the, the pipeline and the struggles that you face when you suddenly are dealing with new things. But I love the fact that you're learning these things under deadline, under pressure for that, because guess what? That's the rest of your career. Um, you're going to be <laughs> lifelong learners and you have shown it beautifully here. So well done, Ross. Thank you so much for joining us for the conversation today. I really appreciate your time and team fighter robo. Congratulations one more time. I want to take it from here before we bring the next team in. Um, we're going to check check out from the animation and visual effects program, uh, we're going to check out a reel on procedural FX that they've put together. And there's some really nice stuff in here uh, to complement all this incredible senior work that we're seeing. So we're going to see that, but thank you, Team Fighter Robo. And thank you, Ross. Let's go to the video. And we are here with Treble and Bass for their project, Treble and Bass. Thank you, Rob. Uh, as, uh, as Mr. Lloyd uh, already said, we're Treble and Bass uh, presenting Treble and Bass. I'll leave you to decide which is which, uh, which pronunciation is which. Um, but we should probably, before we present our project, we should probably show the team. Uh, so I'm Rowan Brown. I handle a lot of the back-end production stuff and the um, special visual effects stuff that you might see in our project. I'm George Fee. I was the music composer and the sound engineer. I'm a Diggum student. Hi, I'm Mr. Sanchez. I'm a game zone student, and I handle the game art and the concept art. 
Hi, I'm Li Guan, game design student. I'm working on programming and UI design. Hello, my name is Michael Giorgiani, and I'm a CCI major working on the programming aspects of our project. Hello, everyone. My name is Ramzi Alaji, and I also worked on programming. Uh, and not currently presenting with us, but deserving of special mention is our advisor, Paul Diefenbach. Uh, now that we've sort of introduced the team, uh, we're going to go into a short sneak peek uh, trailer for our project. Uh, we really hope you enjoy it. Well, what was that? So, <laughs> um, well, Trouble Mass is a digital experience for those creatives out there who want to make music in style. Uh, you get dropped into this wood-carved ocean and get to make music by spawning in fish and props to play with as you go. Um, Let's talk about art style. In the top image, you can see some early concept work, and two images below are what we said alone. We wanted a bright color palette to not only catch the player's eye, but also so that the textures aren't washed out by the blue of the water. Luckily, we have the freedom to go for a more stylized look using sail ships to mimic the interplay of light, color, and water. Here is the UI art. In order to be consistent with the fish art style, we decided to use low poly as our UI art. Based on the color use of all fish models, UI is also divided into two color tones. The cold blue carton is used for fish-related functions, and the yellow warm carton is used for prop-related functions. For better integrate the UI and the game environments in Unity, we, uh, we select glass as a UI texture. The final outcome is the image showing on the bottom. As you can see from the screen capture, our fish vary in shape and size. Not only does it add for more entry into the woods, but it also affects their movement and speed. For example, the koi fish often takes pauses while swimming, going about its manner in a small and in, in a calm way. Also, due to the middle's small size, it moves a bit faster than the average fish, and traveling to school, it darts around the coral reef. So, obviously, the most important thing about our project is the fact that you can make music, and the way you do that is by dropping fish into the tank. Each fish has its own little music track tied to it. And this lets uh, users customize the sound of their own tank, say by dropping in a school of minnows, which, which sound would sound like a choir. Or, and along with the minnows, you can drop in a uh, anglerfish, which would have a deep, low bass sound to it. This effectively lets players make their own soundscape for the tank. In our interactive toy, there are six unique props that have their own effects on the music. Along with their fun looks, you can also use clever placement in the plane to change how much the prop affects the music. We encourage the players to experiment with the props and their placement to get the desired effect from the fish and the music. And in addition, if the player wishes to see an in-depth view of their designed ecosystem, they can select a specific fish press a key and switch to this fish view perspective, and they'll be able to adventure through the environment through the eyes as a selected fish. We also have an interactive submersible, the bassosphere. You can get up close and personal with the fish. Once you've set the scene how you like, you can begin to explore the 3D space using the bassosphere. The bassosphere is a submarine that can use to experience the fish's delightful music from a completely new perspective. 
While in the bassosphere, you can experiment with the spatialized audio and placement of the fish around the plane using food pellets. Food pellets can be fired from the submersible. Any fish nearby will take notice and move towards the food. So we're nearing towards the end of our presentation, but if you wish to learn more about treble and bass, you can visit our website, trebleandbassgame.squarespace.com, or you can scan this QR code on your phone. That will take you to our site where you can view information on the different fish that's available and learn the various sounds they make and things like that. So you can check that stuff out at our website. In the end, we will give our special thanks to our professor advisors first, Paul Diefenbach and Robo Lloyd. Thanks for their artistic and technical help. Finally, we also need to give our special thanks to our family for their support and the participation of today's audience. Thank you. Uh, that pretty much concludes our presentation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did showcasing it. Uh, and thank you for listening. Wow. Um... And, uh, and I really, I really like the fact that uh, essentially we had a couple of computer science students in here. Uh, I, think, I think this is one of the most exciting things about our program and the tight integration between uh, the computer science um, program and the game design program is actually one of the hallmarks of, of our program. Um, and uh, in terms of alumni, who better to uh, chat with you guys as somebody who actually went through both programs, Tim Day, uh, and I um, completed the undergraduate program in computer science uh, and the graduate program in digital media. He graduated in 2018 and he's now software engineer at Magic Fuel Games. Tim. Hi. Um, well, uh, congrats, guys. Uh, you made it through this uh, uh, heck of a year. Um, uh, pat yourselves on the back. Uh, I know, I know what it's like to, to go through this process. I can't imagine uh, during uh, COVID and everything. So, so well done. Um, uh, yeah, the, the biggest question I have, um, and if you ask any game dev, like maybe what their two least favorite things are, uh, they'll, you'll probably get quite a few responses that say audio and water. Uh, so I'm curious what your motivation was to focus on both as pretty much the hallmark features of your, of your project here? Uh, I can actually really answer this one. Um, it's kind of a long story. <laughs> uh, really, really early on in production, um, we were sort of like running through all these, all these different ideas of what we would want to do for the project. You know, there was um, like one idea was like a uh, sort of Slay the Spire sort of deck building roguelike. There was another one that was like, um, I forget, there was another sim sort of thing. And eventually I was just like, you know, I just really hate how how common it is for games to be very combat focused and action-y. And that's not a bad thing, but also what if we just did the opposite of that? Um, and so that's where it started. So the initial idea was a like old themed fish, like koi pond. So one of the very first fish that we ever thought of was the koi fish, and just the rest is history <laughs> and production. Uh, so with uh, with with like all the audio challenges, uh, that's an interesting setup to test. You have all these different combinations uh, of of sounds the players can make. Uh, so I'm a little curious what was the what was the testing process like for that, uh, making sure that the combinations sound good and that, that people actually like the different combinations that they can create? Uh, we, um, the creation process was mainly just going into different sound. Uh, I think I cakewalk and just writing a bunch of stuff um, and then just playing it all at different times, like moving pieces of the music uh, about, uh, about four beats later, stuff like that, seeing if it sounded good. And then um, we had a bunch of uh, testing um, phases where we, we gave the game to other players, other people from the major 
and people outside the major and stuff, let them play it and see if they liked it and if they didn't. And then we made changes based on that. Uh, awesome. Uh, and I guess a question for the, the engineers and the carters, uh, what did you guys uh, like or dislike about working on audio? Like I said, it's kind of, uh, unfortunately, it often gets left to be the you know last thought in a lot of processes, but it had to be front and center here. So uh, did you like working on a lot of audio related things? And yeah. Um, I can, I can say for my part, um, I think the biggest challenge of coding integrated with audio was not necessarily the programming part of it, but the actual, I guess, audio engineering part, making sure everything mixes well. And I guess that is kind of hard to do within like coding. But I think that in my experience was the most challenging part of that. Yeah, luckily you had somebody with musical background and George Fee that really stepped in and really got deep in the, the weeds with uh, Wise as middleware. Um, so the, you know, you guys went through a couple of different pivots, right? You, you changed a few things and, you know, what if we bought you five more weeks? No, don't make us work any longer. We're supposed to graduate. You know, where would you grow this project? I can't speak for all of us, but personally, I think, uh, Add more, like, I wouldn't add more in the sense of like adding more f like different fish, adding um, different props to like other w more ways to modify the music, um, some graphical tweaks. <laughs> uh, there's the still, yeah. yeah. On the graphics end, um, you know, I think Nasir's concept art and the woodcut aesthetic of the fish really drove the look, uh, the project as you came to the to the end there. Nasir, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the art side? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, as from the concept art, we were going through a few ideas, and we thought for, I guess, our, our solid game before we had any really art for it, more whimsical than. I don't know, a, a realistic fish, just like to, to have in a tank. And we wanted to be a bit more, yeah, like bright in front to look at and like have, you know, different variations of them. And the wood carved car style, it was, the first model was a, a bit dumb by accident, but like, because it wasn't quite the look I was going for, but like comparing it to what I wanted, it looked nice. And the textures were based off how like light reflects off of uh, objects on water and it like flickers here and there. So I wanted that cell shape to kind of mimic the rays that vary in like hues and, and uh, saturation. All right. Um, with that, I want to bring us back into the animation mood. Um, with our next uh, video before we have our next team come on. But before then, I want to congratulate uh, Treble and Bass Bass uh, for your efforts uh, this year. Um, hard go and a difficult uh, year in which to make anything, let alone something that is meant to bring you a peaceful sense of quietude and, and um, personal intimate enjoyment like that. So, And thank you so much uh, to Tim Day for joining us, uh, taking time out of your day and your weekend to join us for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's always good to see you again, Tim. Um, so with that, uh, we're actually going to um, go and check out in the animation mood, one of our student clubs, the Motion Capture Club and their reel. And uh, before we go to that, just one last thanks to Treble and Bass Bass and Tim, thank you so much. Here's our video.
And we are here with the senior project team from Animation and Visual Effects, Toy Box, and their film, Dungeons and Stuffing. Once upon a time, in a land far away, we come across a pair of sibling heroes. Here's Sword, lightning fast and master of the blade. Here is Shield, our steadfast hero. He stands unwavering in the face of danger. And together they will... <clears throat> they will have to work together on their quest to claim the sacred scroll of Wifi, hidden in the Leviathan's Cove. Our heroes enter the cave, and not one second in, they come across their first obstacle. The dreaded tightrope. They'll have to work together to balance each other out and get across. Ooh, um, uh, <laughs> well, our heroes were able to move over the tightrope, but not unscathed. Our heroes come into a new passageway, but they best watch each other's backs. Oh dear. Seems like Sword has finally gotten the right idea. Huh. Or not. Are, um, g guys. Guys! Our heroes were able to escape the cave and reach the Cove of the Leviathan. The treasure they sought sat on the ship below. Really? Even when it's right in front of you? Fine, then how about this? Out of the depths came a fearsome beast. Your constant fighting has awoken it, and it is not happy. Rawr. What? It's... Look, it's good. I didn't have a lot of... <clears throat> the Leviathan launches a mighty attack. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Oh, no you don't. Ha! Trying this attack again. You insolent fools! That was my favorite fin! You won. Here's the sacred scroll of Wi-Fi. I won't play that. Really? You don't just want to go play on the computer or something? Scared you're gonna lose again? Yeah, well, I was going easy on you that time. Nuh uh. We totally beat you. Alright, come on and help me put another set together then. Okay. Hi, thank you for watching our show. Um, I'm Brian. I'm the project manager. I did a lot of stuff for this project. My name is Will. I did the storyboarding, concept art, texturing, and lighting for this project. My name's Augustus. I did modeling, animation, and I worked on constructing the Leviathan. My name is Neil. I worked on the animation and concept art. And my name is Adrian. I worked on the animation simulations and 3D modeling. So as the title suggests, um, Dungeons and Stuffing. Our story started with building something around kids playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but none of us have actually ever played Dungeons and Dragons before. Uh, a little bit of oversight, but that's whatever. Um, so we didn't really know about all these rules and characters and how they were built. So it ended up mostly just being a loose basis with really only the adventure aspect of Dungeons and Dragons carrying through. Uh, plus, we really just like the title of Dungeons and Stuffing. Uh, we didn't really have any grand themes to put into our short. Uh, you know, we didn't have any big message, but we just wanted to make something that's really fun, you know, a fun story of two kids learning to work together to beat their older siblings. 
Part of what inspired us came from the dynamic of whimsical childhood adventures where playing around with one's imagination could create a world in and of itself. Uh, popular works like Calvin and Hobbes and the Lego movie, among other things, helped guide us in creating a fantastical setting that was still built around objects from the real world. Uh, the power of this setting is shown when our personal problems from our world are solved as a result of the actions taken within the bounds of the imagined world. For the character designs for our heroes, we wanted to make protagonists who were cuddly and gave off the idea of children's toys. On the left were the original concepts for Sword, Shield, and Leviathan, and on the right are their final designs. Sword and Shield were the two characters I focused on primarily. I designed them based off of com combined memories of my child childhood stuffed animals and my own little sister's own childhood stuffed animals. The biggest changes to their designs were to lengthen their limbs and to give Sword a body so that they would transition to 3D better. For the Leviathan design, we wanted to convey that the narrator had quickly thrown together a sock puppet to fight the two heroes who at that point had just completely stopped listening to him. When it came to actually designing the Leviathan, I took inspiration from video game bosses that I honestly just thought looked really cool. I thought that taking inspiration from video games would be fitting considering the overall vibe of the short, and also if you look at the sock puppet, you know, and the two characters on the screen just kind of fits the form exactly. So for the aesthetic, we decided we want to try and uh, build something that had these recognizable real world objects with this sort of arts and craftsy fantasy world. Um, and so kind of some of our inspirations was uh, Yoshi's Woolly World, which you can see in the top left. Um, so we decided that the most authentic way to really do this was to actually build some of these things in real life. So Will actually, uh, cut out some of these pieces in cardboard and colored them and actually colored some pieces also on paper and then took pictures and modeled them into this uh, 3D environment to kind of create this aesthetic that we wanted. Thank you again for watching our shirt. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Hey, great, uh, great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. And I, I saw I saw a lot of positive comments on the in the chat. Keep it coming. Uh, you know, kind of if you're on the chat, we certainly appreciate your comments. Now, uh, it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce you essentially one of our star alumni, uh, Will Muto. He graduated from the Graded program in 2009, and he is senior pipeline technical director in the, at Industrial Light and Magic. Will. Hey, everyone. Uh, hey, well. Congratulations on completing a really ambitious and beautiful short. This was this was a really a pleasure to watch. Um, I I was I was really impressed by the um, aesthetic. You really nailed the production design, um, and I was interested to hear kind of more about uh, the planning you did for uh, for nailing this sort of aesthetic. And um, I, I also really appreciated hearing about like the real world, real world kind of prototyping and uh, the, the practical, uh, the, the practical uh, look dev that you did. Could you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I can just talk about some more. So at the beginning of our process, we had to, you know, in order to get the idea of like, you know, these are kids building a set for their own little game. Uh, so we have to, you know, think about what's, um, you know, how much could a, a child and like a slightly older child make on their own. So we couldn't go like too far, we can like, really, really detail, you know, things like miniatures and stuff that'll be too much. You know, so we um, look up some reference, uh, mostly like, you know, children's uh, dioramas for like science projects and such. And we use those things as um, reference for, you know, our cardboard trees and um, the backgrounds being drawings. And the, uh, I don't know if it was visible in the uh, short because it's not really close to it, but the walls of our cave, quote unquote, is, is just a blanket. I, no I noticed the stitching, uh, which was a really, really nice touch. <laughs> um, yeah, th that's uh, that's great. I, I with a, I, there were so many moving parts to this with multiple locations. You had dynamics. Um, 
and any show, whether it's a feature or a short, there's a lot of moving parts and things don't always go as planned, um, uh, which can impact the pipeline sort of uh, down the line. Um, was there a challenge that caught you off guard and then how the team uh, was able to kind of react to it? I could take this one. So we were, over the course of the previous spring and summer, we were pretty invested in developing the aesthetic and idea of the world we were getting into. Um, I think the first big challenge we ran into was when developing the midsection of our story. Um, we had originally planned for um, a couple of different scenarios, but mainly revolving around the idea of like the esoteric, like Indiana Jones style traps with like <laughs> rolling boulders. And obviously you can see that with the uh, darts shooting out and the uh, tight rope walk. Um, but uh, with help from our advisors, we were able to sort of trim the fat as it were and get a sequence of events that helped develop the story and was entertaining. That that's great. I, I, with with something of this size too, I th I think like my my day to day job is trying to make sure that data flows efficiently between departments um, and on large teams of artists. So, what were some of the things? Uh, and this is a question for everyone. Um, what, what were some of the things that were learned uh, going through iterations, like? Were there things that you did to speed up your process? Uh, were there things that um, that uh, added were some unexpected kind of speed bumps moving moving back and forth between departments and and how did you approach this? Um, I could take a little bit on this. Um, I was trying to make some of these simulations through Houdini and trying to figure out actually moving these um, simulated either blocks falling or these breaking animations, trying to actually move them into uh, Maya became kind of a challenge. Um, and so uh, over time, I think we kind of figured out a little bit better of a method, but it took some iterations to really figure that out, so. Uh, and were there uh, with, you had mentioned there were some kind of uh, that there were story changes and some adjustments in the cut. Um, uh, did that uh, sort of affect schedule as well? That which is something that happens all the time in the in 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 uh, real production environments as well. I feel like there was, but we took a really long block of time this summer to just very sol solidly board out exactly what traps we wanted to use, exactly what story beats we wanted to use so that when we got to the actual production process, we weren't like cutting any large blocks of the stuff. Um, there were definitely shots here and there that we had to add, but in the summer where we had maybe six or seven traps and different beats that we'd wanted to use, we narrowed it down to the main three in the last cave scene by uh, the fall session. So it was pretty smooth sailing as soon as we got that nailed down. That's, that's great. The early, early work ahead of time definitely saves down the line. That's great. Yeah, setting up that pipeline and getting it as strong as possible in their early terms uh, is, is definitely key. Um, uh, William, I have to say, which came first, the plushie behind you or the, the, the film? This is amazing. <laughs> the film. And actually, it's I'm glad you mentioned that because I kept seeing everyone in chat ask about them. Um, we ordered those for our short because we want, wanted to have the live action segment. Um, and we got them designed. I sent in designs to a plushie maker as a commission, except they got here too late for us to include them in the showcase. So we're hoping to reshoot a scene for the film festival with using the actual real life counterparts. Excellent. So that is definitely, ladies and uh, everybody out there, you want to make sure that you're uh, looking for the announcement of the uh, digital media animation festival that'll happen uh, closer to commencement because uh, you want to see those plushies in action. Um, congratulations to the entire Torbox team. And I, this, this film is one of the stars. It's just lovely. And thank you so much, Will, for joining us uh, for this conversation. We really appreciate your time and perspective on this. Um, 
I'm going to keep the ball rolling here. We want to jump to seeing a video from one of our student organizations, the uh, Extended Reality Club, uh, VRARXR group, Duxer, I call them, but I don't know if they call themselves Duxer, but I do. Um, they can yell at me later for that one. Um, but again, one more time, uh, thank you so much, Toy Box, and congratulations. And thanks again, Will, for your time today. And we're going to see DUXR. And we're back into the world of games with Lone Bowie Games and their project, Rock Hopper. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Lone Bowie Games, and we're here to present to you the game that we've been working on for the past seven to eight months, Rock Hopper. Please enjoy our short trailer. Rockhopper is a game about little old Rocky. Rocky here is like the other penguins because he has a deep fear of water. You'll set off on a journey as Rocky and explore this tropical world of penguins, unlike anything that you've seen before. Since Rocky can't swim, he relies on his trusty chip, the salty shell. You're gonna love exploring this world and seeking out the secrets hidden within it. You'll use your fishing rod and your ship to interact with the world, seek out different islands, complete different challenges, and fish around for a good time in Rockhopper. And these are the members of our game design team. I am Sai, I'm the team lead and an artist on the team. I'm Devin, I'm a level designer and artist. 
I'm Alex. I'm the rigger and animator for the team. I'm AJ. I'm the art lead. And I'm Greg. I'm a technical artist. And these are the members of our CCI team. Uh, Taha Gabri, Samantha Tache, David Turco, Liam Austinfort, Jay Patel, and Scott Natter. Um, they're not here with, in this presentation with us right now, but they're definitely in the audience watching and they've contributed a ton to this project. And we're very proud of all the work they've done. These are our advisors for this project, Professor Tony A. Rowe, Professor Rob Lloyd, and Dr. Filippos Vokalos. We're very grateful for all the guidance that they've given us throughout this entire process. And we wouldn't be where we are now without any of their help. And we'd like to thank all the faculty that, we, that has helped us along the way. Explore all the Sunshore Islands, maybe head to the Serpent's Maw and brave the rough waves, or go to the Hermit's Island and pass his fishing trail. Wherever you are, there's sure to be adventure. Look around and talk to all the zany characters you encounter on your journey. They all have a story to tell. Who knows, you might even find a quest or two. Now, all penguins love fish, and Rocky is no different. But if he can't swim, how does he catch any fish? Well, that's where his trusty fishing rod comes in handy. But it's not just for fishing. In fact, you can hook onto those pesky floating docks and move them around to traverse the islands a lot easier. And uh, should you have a hankering for the wide open ocean, jump onto your boat, the salty shell, and set sailing. Everything's not sunshine and rainbows in the Sunshore Islands. Beware of the treacherous waters on your voyage. Take your shot at clearing the wave-filled serpent's maw. However, should you be caught between a wave and a rock, you'll find yourself waking up at the last dock. Perhaps you'll even find yourself in the notorious sunken shoal. Here, you have to navigate your way through a whirlpool maze, or else you find your end. Now, please enjoy our short gameplay walkthrough. Welcome to the Sunshore Islands. Let's start by talking to our brother Johnny. Johnny will give Rocky various tasks to do, such as collecting palm fronds for roof repairs, and even searching for a wayward conch shell. In this instance, let's focus on the shell. Let's see if we can't cross the water and grab that oversized conch shell. There are various ways to go about it, but let's make use of these floating docks by hooking them with the fishing rod. Upon picking it up, it goes right into our inventory for later. Let's jump ahead in our adventure. Here we see Rocky talking to the hermit. He has Rocky go fishing for him, but demands that he does so quickly. So, let's go fishing. Upon interacting with the fishing spot, Rocky must keep the fish on the line until the time hits zero in order to catch a fish. Nice catch! Let's go hop on the water. The ocean in this world has some strange anomalies that could ruin anyone's day. Whirlpools, for example, requires Rocky to avoid them at all costs. If Rocky were to be sucked into one, a quick dash can free him. Otherwise, he might get sucked into the depths of the ocean and wake up elsewhere. Expect dangers like these and more as you travel across the sea. Who knows, you might even come across a collectible or two. Maybe even a secret that no one has yet to discover? Come on down and figure out what all the Sunshore Islands have to offer in our game Rock Hopper. Hope you enjoyed it. Now, throughout this process, we encountered a number of different challenges along the way that we overcame. And one of the biggest challenges that we faced was creating a believable lived-in world that we had to design completely from scratch. And as you can see in the slide, Rock Hopper evolved drastically from the concepting phase all the way to the eventual final demo that we have now. 
And we're very proud of the colorful world that we managed to create along the way. Another achievement for our game was creating a lively and exciting ocean environment. A lot of collaborative work took place in order to produce this effect. I personally worked with Samantha on the main water shader and we accomplished a lot together to create this vibrant ocean world. Thank you. Um, I, I hope you liked the glimpse of what Rock Opera has to offer. Um, please go and do check out our social, uh, our website, lonebuoygames.wordpress.com. Try out our latest build and I hope you have fun. The QR code directly takes you there as well. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lonebuoygames for any developments that happen on Rock Hopper. Um, thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Woohoo! Great, great stuff. Um, as was pointed out in the chat, uh, open world games are notoriously difficult to implement. And uh, as I saw, some already asking for where can I essentially sign up for it. So that 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 is excellent. That's really really good. And I'm also very excited to see another collaboration with computer science. Um, with us in the chat now is Pat Kemp. Uh, he graduated from. Uh, digital media in 2006 and uh, is game designer it's prefox Pat. Uh, just gonna join us in a moment yes um while we wait for pat to join us on the stream here um we uh I want to know a little bit more about why you came up with this idea of a penguin who could not swim. Why the, the little fish out of water or fish in water? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, yeah. I, it looks like our alum is here. Um, sh should I answer that question first and then? Go for it. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, I can expand a little bit on why sort of the idea of a penguin. Um, I think that, you know, we're all sort of, we're all when this during this game process, right? We're all in the midst of COVID and we're making this game and we really wanted to make something that was kind of lighthearted and kind of very simple and fun at the core of it. And we really felt like the penguin and like just the character of a penguin just really carries that motion really well. And so, um, and then we thought, you know, what's funnier than a penguin that can do everything that penguin does. I, I don't know. I just, we all thought it was hilarious. I, I, I hope to think that other people thought it was hilarious too. All right. Welcome into the, uh, the conversation, Pat, um, uh, game designer at Spry Fox Studios. And thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, the presentation looked great. Uh, congratulations on the really kind of a game with a charming look and kind of like an appealing hook. Uh, I love the the penguin who's scared of water is a, I don't know, it's a really kind of inviting idea. Um, uh, and uh, I, I particularly like the um, the fishing rod. It, it seemed like the, uh, it was a kind of example of getting multiple uses out of a single player verb. It looked like you could catch fish and move, move platforms around, which is, that's just a really clever design decision. So um, congrats. Um, I was wondering, cause you know, open worlds, open world games are kind of, you know, ambitious by definition. And as a small team, you've got to, you know, pick where to focus your efforts. Um, how did you decide what to include when you're working in a genre for lots of stuff? I can take that. So part of our design for the game was built around the idea that we do have a smaller team. We just have the five games that starts here. We have a team of five CCI students, or I actually believe six, sorry, <laughs> six CCI students. Uh, so from the start, we knew that we weren't going to make Skyrim. We weren't going to make any of these large open world kind of games, but we can make something that maybe has a lot of open water, that maybe has some procedural generation, maybe some tools we can use to make terrain easier, maybe some tools we can use to make the world more exciting. So we have these fishing spots, we have, you know, these kind of uh, different things in the water. We have a large world because we're able to populate it with the water and with all these water hazards. So really the way we dealt with open world is just by making sure it's baked into the design of the game from the start. 
Yeah. Awesome. If, if I could add on to that, I think going off of uh, your point, Pat, about using the fishing rod multiple different ways, um, that was kind of a design decision that we made to help uh, bring in our scope a little bit. Like we're creating this system of being able to use the fishing rod. So why not use it for multiple ways to interact with the game? It makes sense. And it helped us um, create many different um, avenues for the player to take and interact with the world in different ways while still keeping our scope with our mechanics um, in sight. Yeah, it's really great. It's a it's a economical decision to to do that. So you know, uh, from from the development point of view, um, you don't have to make a whole bunch of new game mechanics if you can apply the same in multiple places. And it also makes it easier on the player because they learn how to cast the fishing rod, and then they can use that knowledge in a bunch of different applications. So, yeah, good idea all around. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Could you tell me a bit about your playtesting process and what lessons came out of it? Like. What did you learn from observing people playing the game? Yeah, um, I think that uh, one of the sort of biggest um, things that came about from playtesting was uh, motion sickness. Um, like, I, I know, like, I personally don't have any problems, but I didn't realize how much of an issue it was for certain people um, until we kind of playtested and, like, had people try out going onto the water on the boat, moving around. We, we tried different builds with the water larger waves, smaller waves, less volatile. Like we tried a number of different settings to try and find like that sweet spot where people weren't really feeling that motion sickness. And it felt nice and fun to sort of like go around sailing on the boat. So there's definitely that was one of the areas that playtesting really helped us. Yeah, we found the solution was to just basically find a way to stabilize the camera separate from the player when they're on the boat. So instead of you looking at the water and you feel like you're tilting with the boat, you're looking at the water and you see yourself tilting. A little bit, little bit easier for people to understand. Awesome. Um, so I found in my work that when, even when I'm kind of familiar with a genre as a player, um, when I, when the time comes to actually work in a genre, I find myself learning all these unexpected lessons about what goes into making a certain kind of game. Um, what kind of unexpected lessons or surprises came up about making an open world game for, for all of you. You have to, when you're setting up your scenes, you have to take a lot of care to how things load in. When you're dealing in, you know, 10,000 units out, 100,000 units out, there has to be certain, you have to make sure you write certain code that loads things in at the correct time, not too early, not too late, so you can run it smoothly and it can look okay. That took a lot of work to get right. Um, I'd like to ask AJ maybe to, uh, I think, because AJ worked a ton on the world building of this world. I'd like, I don't know if you, if you had maybe a few points that he could drop for us. Um, I mean, when it comes to world building, uh, it's, well, most of the world building is in the story, and we made sure that all the NPCs uh, have a voice. Not all of them say too much, but there's a good bit of them that have nice little story elements that kind of add to the lore and you know make the world feel more alive and lived in than it otherwise would be. Absolutely. If you get a chance to stroll around uh, as Rocky and explore this world, talk to everybody. Um, there's some really funny lines in there. So kudos to the writers and uh, just overall really nicely well done. Um, I'm going to keep us rolling into the next group, but I want to give one last congratulations to Lone Buoy Games and their project Rock Hopper. And special thanks to Pat Kemp who join, for joining us today in this conversation and uh, helping us celebrate these teams. Thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciate your time today. All right. My pleasure. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, we're going to go and check out some more uh, demo clips from the animation and visual effects department, some really cool stuff. And uh, we're going to go to that and on to our next team. Thank you all. Oh, 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 oh,
We're team egg salad. Oh, and we're, we're back. That's my line. I got to have something to do. <laughs> no, I don't want to throw you off, but here it is. Team egg salad and their project, Ask the Undead. Uh, it is now all yours, and I'll get that out of my system. Thank you. Yes, we are indeed team egg salad. This is our short, Ask the Undead. Ask the Undead is an animation about two friends who go looking for a magical cure-all flower called the White Rose until they run into the evil spirit of the forest. Here's our video. Rosie, tell me this legend again. There's a rare white rose that can cure all evil spirits and untreatable sicknesses. And that's why we're getting it for your mom? Because she's sick? Yes. But this is all just a legend. Some things just don't have cures. Look, Spike, if you don't want to help me find the white rose, then you can just go home. Fine. Maybe I will go home. Fine. Just don't get eaten by the evil spirit here. The what? There's an evil spirit that doesn't want to be cured by the white rose. So it trapped it in these very woods. If anything, I'm trapped here with you. Just be on the lookout for a white rose, okay? Rosie, you got us lost. Spike! Spike! Ha! Huh. Made it out before Rosie. Did she actually get lost? Rosie! Phew. It had to be the black rose. Like, he was right behind me. Spike, are you okay? She'll be fine. It's just the white rose anyway. How hard can it be to find? Hmm. Hmm. I bet there's even more roses inside. Stupid, Spike. Like, it's not that hard to believe me. <gasps>
Thank you so much for watching our short. And here's the team. Hi, I'm Rachel Jacobson. I did the rigging, lighting, and animation. Hi, I'm Nicholas Moy. I was the storyboarder, modeler, and animator. And I'm Justin Ruda. I was the project lead, texture artist, and animator. And our child voice actors were Enzo Ruda and Josie Ruda. Huge shout out to them for making this happen. So, um, as the undead, uh, what we wanted to do is we took some inspiration from a fairy tale, but we changed a lot of the details to make it our own. We wanted the style to seem like a storybook that sprung to life, and we used simple, stylized backgrounds and vibrant colors. For our characters, we want them to be cartoony, but also semi realistic in order to make animating easier. We unified everything together with an article dream shader to achieve the cartoon look. This gave objects flat colors and outline. This style also helped us render our shots a lot. Some of the challenges we faced during this project were COVID and the lack of face-to-face -face communication because of that. That uh, really hindered some of our ability to get together. Uh, this was also our first time taking on a project of this scale and complexity. Um, so m most of it was learning as we went. And we had some story and animation changes in the winter term and not just in the winter term, but like we continue to have little edit plot edits and changes after that. So that's that set back some of the our time because we had to go back and recut storyboards and everything. And we also had issues scheduling meetings that lined up with everyone because everyone was on different class schedules. Uh, our production process worked where in the fall, we did all the modeling and character design. Winter, we did all the rigging. And spring, we did uh, almost entirely just animation. Though throughout, we kept modifying and tweaking the story as it went and even rearranging some scenes near the end, even after they've already been rendered. And we will be showing our project again at the animation festival. We would love to show some more behind the scenes stuff there. It'll be on June 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for your viewership. Excellent project, excellent project, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. I saw a lot of, not surprisingly, a lot of egg emojis, a lot of salad emojis. Uh, so, so that 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 is that is awesome. Uh, and by the way, if you are for those of you that are on the chat, don't forget to press the like button. You know, kind of, I, I'd like to see my likes um, in our chat. And I think he already joined us now. He was he was watching it uh, essentially um, outside of, of of this of this room. But Eric Hiller, he graduated from the digital media department in 2018, and he is currently CG generalist at Powerhouse FFX. VFX, sorry. Well, while we wait for Eric to join the room with us, um, I'm curious, uh, egg salad? Come on, I, it's so it's so often s senior team names are like, we made this up at the last minute, so we're gonna call ourselves last minute. So where does egg salad come from? I, I can take this one. So it was it was really funny. I was walking with Justin outside, like a long urban eatery. We were just at our project, yeah, I said, Hey, Justin said, Hey, what should we name our, our, our team? I said, I don't know, something like egg salad. He says, I like it. We'll name it egg salad. And at the time, I thought that would just be a temporary name. We'll change it to something more official. But nope, that stuck. And we've been forever known as egg salad. For my part, I honestly did not care what our team name was. So I just went along with it when they suggested it. <laughs> Well, I like that. All right. I think I see, I think I've realized the challenge here. And do we have Eric with us? Hello. I must have been in the wrong room. No, um, I just realized that uh, you're coming in through uh, somebody else. You, 
apparently you're Francesca Cimino. Um, oh, so congratulations. <laughs> and that's why, so ladies and gentlemen, this, there's a lot of moving parts for something like this. And I've been introing uh, the wrong video for the last like three uh, um, teams. At least I haven't introduced the wrong team yet. Um, but the part of Francesca will be played by Eric Hiller today. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Uh, what do you think of this um, egg salad group? Uh, this project's great. I love it. Uh, I very much enjoyed the characters. They're kind of snarky towards each other, and then their designs kind of like mimic that. Uh, there are some shots that stood out to me that seemed to work very, very well, especially the ones where the character is being flung around the barn or uh, jumping down onto the rows or when the girl is flung into the door. Those all seem to have uh, very good contrast. Not only was it like fast motion, but it was uh, followed by slower motion and it kind of sold the weight. Um, not only that, there seemed to be some rather advanced things going on with the rigs because not only do you have character rigs, you seem to have uh, working skirts, whether that was simulation or the rose uh, rig. So I wanted to ask a little bit more, especially about the rigs. Like, we'll start with the rose rig. Like, how did you guys uh, figure out how to make that work so fluidly. Um, I can take that. So similar to the vines, we had first just a spline. This was mostly a fall term when we were doing the rigging. That it was just joint after joint after joint, and we realized as us being the three animators, we're like, wow, this is terrible for a rig. We need something a bit more um, advanced. So Rachel came to us and said, like, hey, I found some tutorials online. We can make it so that way we simply click any one of the rows and drag it, similar to. Um, professional studio um, facial rigging, where you can click anywhere on the face and drag it to our, however you're liking this. So now we can quite literally draw lines across the screen, and the vines and the rose rig, for example, will bend to our will. So pretty, pretty well, I would say much better than what we had before. That was just um, a string of roses. So hopefully, if there's any freshmen watching or underclassmen, don't don't go with um, don't go with spines. Go with um, go with lines. I guess I'll say that. <laughs> Uh, and then how did you guys figure out the uh, the skirt? Uh, it seemed to be simulated? Yes, that, that too. So I think we used N-Cloth was the engine we used, which was built into Maya and Unity. And it isn't present in all the scenes, but it's present in the scenes where we thought it was truly necessary to show motion, like when she's falling or running. Um, it was as simple as like clicking the skirt and, um, oh no, it was something before that. It was like, make the body decliner. For anyone that's used game engines or Maya before, you make the body itself, the girl, she was the collider and the skirt was the end cloth, and it was as simple as that. Nice. Yeah, definitely, definitely sold. And I think budgeting yourself uh, to uh, simulate only where needed is especially important. And it seems to you guys who did the same uh, with animation. Uh, I know story wise, the uh, I, I'm not like. Uh, well, I'm very familiar with like story changes, like towards the end of the process. Rob can tell you all about that. <laughs> but uh, how did you guys uh, figure out uh, budgeting animation time towards different shots, uh, especially with the evolving storyline? I could take some of that. So I don't know for everyone else, but for me personally, I was just like, I had big spreadsheets. So I was like making the shots and thinking which ones were the most integral to the story or had the most like action or emotional impact. Yeah focus my time on those shots. Uh, I had a lot of the barn shots with the ones that really action heavy near the end. So I really tried to focus my time on making those as polished as possible. And the ones that were like, I felt that weren't as important to the story, I you know, didn't spend as much time in them. I did not last. Absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can definitely see uh, similar budgeting in, in, in most productions. Um, also, the, the lighting for this being not uh, a traditional like physically based lighting, but it was cell shaded. Um, I've done a little bit of cell shading in the past and it is not easy. Uh, you think it's just like, oh, just put, put a light and it should just do it right. And then you'll get all these weird lines. Uh, you guys seem to uh, make that work. Is there anything you guys did to try to make that work better than, uh, like you guys got into it. Did you see any hurdles and need to adapt it, change it to, to make that work? Um, uh, yes. Oh, you can take that if you want, Rachel. 
Oh, okay. I can take part of this. Um, uh, for the lighting, we mostly went from on like a shot to shot basis. So actually, in some shots, we cheated, and the sun's pointing a different way than it no than it should be in that scene, even even relative to where the characters are from each other, just because uh, in order to make the cell share look the best it can be, you need uh, the lighting need to be framed a certain way. And Justin did a lot of really great work with making like the the values of the light the lighting not be too bright but not be too dark at the same time. And the rest, um, in some shots, I tweaked in post production to make it almost have almost sort of a bloom effect in some shots, depending on what was most suitable for the scene. And the only thing the only thing I wanted to say is I wanted to thank Blake Bridges for helping us out with that. Um, after we got the core shadow down in the um, the tune shader, she was the one who's like, "Hey, you can add some depth to the shadow and uh, give like a texture." And you, you can kind of see that in the, the short. So thank you, Blady, and uh, Professor Nick as well. Definitely. Uh, for the the texture, I think the texture works very well in the shadows for when it was static. Uh, was there any decision to have uh, not static noise or static noise in certain places? Was there uh, decisions being made that way? Yes, and it was originally um, our professors who came to us, similar to the, uh, the last answer. Um, Lady was like, this needs a bit more depth. It looks great as it is, but we wanted to go that extra step and add the, the texture to it. And as Rachel said, we cheated by adding the light in different directions to make it perfect. Because if you shine directly, light directly on them, there's no shadow at all. And that's just how the tune shader works. As you said, it's a bit hard to use. But ultimately, um, plugging in, it wasn't an image. I think it was actually within Maya itself. So it was actually a lot easier than it looks. But, uh, yeah, I think it worked out in the end. Nice. And well done all around, um, Team Egg Salad, and uh, this uh, great little story that you tell, and a lot of different uh, technical pipelines that you guys were working out, a lot of different challenges you took on and had to figure out on the fly. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing your work with us today. And again, everyone, if you want to see more and hear more about the, back so the, the, the backstage efforts of these uh, uh, animation productions look out for the animation festival uh in about a, two weeks i think is the exact date somebody will put it in the chat and correct me because i've been making mistakes all day um but eric thank you so much for joining us uh, i'm going to ask you to stick around even if you're going to be named francesca i want you to stick around <laughs> for the next team and uh we're going to go and i'm going to introduce one more time from the animation visual effects department uh, a demo clip of all sorts of really cool student work that they've been doing um, so enjoy that video and we'll be back for the next team in just a moment
we are back with another animation and visual effects team. This time it is Rhythmic Renders and their film, Not on the List. All right. Hello, everyone. We are indeed Rhythmic Renders, and we have spent the last nine months working on an animated short entitled Not on the List. So seen here are the hardworking members of our crew, including myself, Matt White, responsible mainly for production, directorial, and editing activities, and I'll allow the rest of my team to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Angelica Rogers, and I'm the character lead. Hello, I'm Brian. I am the environment lead. Hi, I'm Joe Petrucci. I'm the story lead. Hello, everyone. I'm Steven, and I'm the technical lead. Hello, everybody. I'm Xander, and I'm the animation lead. All right, so um, in a nutshell, our show, Not on the List, is a 2.5D animated short where two strangers work together to solve a surreal mystery in a bizarre nightclub. And with that, I'll let the show speak for itself. So please enjoy. I was just heading out. Name? Uh, Trey. You're not on the list. What? Is this a joke? Aren't you supposed to say that to people out? Step out of line, please. You're kidding, right? You don't even have a clipboard. Are we gonna have a problem? I don't know who you think I am, but I'm finding your boss and I'm getting the hell out of here. I go up to the bouncer. Is he not letting you leave either? Yeah, he gonna tell me I'm not on the list. What, what does that even mean? He doesn't even have a clipboard. He doesn't even have a clipboard. So what do we do? I'm trying to find a manager. I'll keep looking around here. I'm Amanda, by the way. I'm Trey. It was nice to meet you. sitting here drinking? Did you find anyone? Uh, how do you know my name? Uh, we just met each other five minutes ago. The bouncer won't let us out. I don't know what you're talking about. I was actually just leaving. What's her problem? <laughs> how did you know the bouncer wouldn't let me out? Huh? Uh, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Okay, that's it. I'm getting the hell out of... What? What the hell? Don't take it. They screw with your memory. You're Amanda, right? <laughs> Did we lose them? What is this place? Name. Trey? <laughs> You're not on the list. Hi, so that was our short uh, not on the list. I hope you liked it. 
Um, it was kind of conceived as like a subversion of the trope that we see a lot in movies and cartoons and TV shows where a character is trying and failing multiple times to get into a club, but they're not on the list like the title implies. Um, but, you know, we, I thought it'd be a cool idea if we just did the opposite where they're already in and they're trying to get out and chaos ensues from there. The visual style takes a lot of inspiration from things like Into the Spider-Verse and uh, the Scott Pilgrim movie and the music videos Takeshi Murakami. And uh, uh, I like where we went with it. So as you can see, the Spider-Verse influence is heavily visible in the lighting and the general aesthetic that we incorporated into the final version of the short. Some of the effects that we included were hyper-stylized tune lines and blur effects such as chromatic aberration. These both serve to highlight the surreal nature of the story. We learned a lot from the development of this project. As you can see, the original storyboards and animatics don't have 2D elements in it, but as we progressed in our journey, we decided to incorporate more of the 2D elements and visual compositing in order to elevate the experience. One of the biggest technical accomplishments that we're really proud of is the 2D facial animation rig that we were able to incorporate in the project. Part of which involved us creating hand-drawn textures, which were essentially made for the eyes, the eyebrows, and the mouth. Uh, together, we combined them with the 3D uh, models to give this really 2.5D look that is uh, what we took as inspiration from movies such as Spider-Wars and so on. Another technical element that we like to integrate into our project was the crowds. See, the crowds, we wanted to make sure that they were populous enough to make the viewer feel more immersed inside the scene. Another creative decision that we decided to take along with this crowd thing is to make them faceless, just to uh, show that, that they were a background element and emphasize the main three characters that we have shown. Uh, taking back to that Spider-Verse uh, style that we have, we also have very big contrasting colors when it comes to the bar scene, which is we went through a lot of back and forth to make sure it is both dark and vibey like a bar would be, but also not too colorful to be childish or whatnot. So that was not on the list by Team Rhythmic Renderers. Uh, we are so grateful and thankful that we have come to the end of this journey. And we really want to shout out to our three amazing advisors, Professor Nick Jushishin, Professor David Mariello, and Professor Milady Bridges. You all were amazing with your encouragement and the advice that you gave us. Also, major love to our special ones and family members who have been with us from day one. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching this. So let's give one additional round of applause to not on the list, which apparently was on our list at least. Um, so uh, great, great stuff, great, great presentation, great, great stuff. Uh, and we have with us again, uh, Eric Hiller, um, AKA, what was Katarina Francesca? Um, and uh, for those that, are, that just joined us, uh, Eric Hiller is a CG journalist at Powerhouse VFX, and he graduated uh, in uh, 2018. Eric. Hey guys. Hello. Congratulations Welcome, again man. on a, another project, another team done, done for the year. Gonna have some good rest and then get back at it, right? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, this project's great, guys. I love it. Uh, there is some very strong character designs and I, I love how much the, the 2D uh, animation that you guys did like really elevates these characters, uh, not only from a concept standpoint, but also animation. Um, I also love the treatment that you guys did to try to make your uh, uh, cell shading lighting like pop, whether it was the separation of the green and the magenta and whatever additional things that you guys added to it. Um, and I just love the, uh, the anime feel of uh, a lot of the moments. <laughs> uh, so a couple of questions. Um, with uh, the treatment that you guys for the magenta and green separation, uh, that was one notable uh, thing you guys did in post-processing in comp. In comp. Uh, is there anything else you guys did uh, in addition to that that you'd like to highlight after the fact? Yeah, so I could talk about that a little bit. The process, like you correctly mentioned, was um, essentially isolating the red and the green channels to push and elevate the chromatic aberration, which the human eye naturally does, except that we just wanted to manipulate it even further so that it added to the surreal effect. 
And on top of that, we made sure that every single image that came out of, a, of the renderer had um, a ZDEP pass, essentially, that allowed us to kind of like blur the um, crowd behind it. Because initially, in our, I think, a really prototype version, we had a crowd, but since they were, like uh, Brian had said, that they had no faces and they were essentially silhouettes, without the blur, it kind of like brought the audience's attention to the crowd as well. And then it was like, oh, what are these crowds without the faces? And, you know, they're just dancing and they're just moving. And so, you know, for that, we had to like blur them as well. And then I think a bigger uh, component is a lot of post was also done in the editing stage. Uh, so because this is a very musically driven, they're like beats to the storyline. So uh, certain cuts on certain rhythmic beats as well. So uh, we had to do that, I think, in post uh, as well. So yeah. I wanted to make sure we lived up to our name as a uh, rhythmic renders. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, so the, you, you spoke a little bit to the uh, separation of the background. I think the, the balance between making an interesting background and one that's too distracting is struck well in a lot of shots. I think there's some shots where it could be uh, tweaked to work better, whether it was tweaks to the composition for the bar scenes or even just adding additional key lights because the, those shots seem to be very dark and the character, I mean, he you can definitely still see him through the eyes and through the rim light, but I think a little additional love with additional key lights would uh, add a little bit to that. Um, Again, this like the cell shading is hard. Is there anything you guys want to add to like what you figured out to make it work better? Because you would think cell shading, oh, you just put a light in and it turns out right, and then it's always weird. So what do you guys think? Well, the funny thing about it is that even though the characters are like the 2.5D cell shading, uh, the backgrounds are all regular surfaces. Um, so we have this like interesting like dynamic where the characters are lit differently than everything else in the environment. And um, I think what we basically learned from that is uh, you have to do a lot of R&D for something like that um, because otherwise, I, mean, I think it looks quite good, but it, there's a lot of opportunities for you to mess up when you try something like that. Absolutely. Is there any that you want to share about the R&D process that helped you along the way? Um, yeah, we. Ha I think the biggest uh, R&D inspiration for at least the tune lines was from the Guilty Gear uh, presentation that they had done like three years ago. Uh, that was, uh, you know, shout out to Professor Milady for doing that. Uh, she like guided us in the right way. And I think one of the features was that they drew like tune lines on the textures specifically. So in in on top of uh, you know the um, renderer putting uh, the, the tune lines on the surfaces of the characters. We also had like tune lines, like maybe on the um, meshes of the clothes um, and even like the meshes of the faces, in fact, in some cases. So uh, that was one thing we took was, it, it was really like, you know, inspired from that Guilty Gear presentation and all that, so yeah. I know the exact presentation, I was looking at the same one. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, how, how did you guys, so you guys added the 2D animation. Is there anything else you wanted to add uh, about how you can made that work? Was Were those meshes in 3D on the faces that would, uh, with different alphas incorporated? Or do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, uh, Angelica, would, uh, you did a lot of the texture work that, would you, do you want to? Um, yeah, no, I mean, the, the texture work kind of just like using a lot of like real life references, like how do the clothes like fold, like, uh, what way if, like, if you have even lighting, like how, where the shower is going to fall and stuff like that, just kind of like using a lot of, uh, references and stuff. But, um, something else, uh, that I want to add, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I don't think so, <laughs> but there's probably definitely, uh, more if, if you look into it. All right. Well, to learn more about um, everything that went on behind the scenes and to get yourself on the list, please be sure to watch our, the various social media feeds for Westfall and digital media to find out the exact details on the upcoming animation festival where you get a chance to see this film again, as well as hear more behind the scenes from the production and the team. Um, we need to move on to our last couple of teams uh, for the day, uh, but uh, congratulations again to Rhythmic Renderers. You lived up to your name. 
And uh, thank you so much, uh, Eric, for joining us uh, for a couple of teams here to, to give your insight and your experience. I really appreciate that. Uh, say hi to Francesca. Um, and uh, from there, we're going to get into the game, uh, game set mindset and check out uh, a, a recent release from our uh, on-campus incubator, Entrepreneurial Game Studios. We're going to check out a new, uh, uh, a recent release of Digital Janitors. And we are back with Heartscape Studio and their project, Growing. Hi, everyone. As Rob said, we're Heartscape Studio, and today we're presenting our Capstone Senior Project game, Growing. I am Annie, the team's producer, and Growing is a short 3D platformer where you awaken as a small sunflower. Your, your caretakers are missing, and you have a funny feeling the lurking cat watching your every move has a paw in this. Using your magical sunflower skills, only you can traverse the towering furniture and save the day. Jump over chairs, swing across stables, and mind the gap. The kitchen floor is actually lava. <laughs> Please enjoy our short video. Hi everyone, I'm Malcolm Bornman, the art lead on Growing, and today I'll be taking you through our initial stages of production. A central goal of ours throughout the process was to create a narrative-driven game with compelling characters. We knew we needed our protagonist to be a flower in order to fit our chosen narrative, but the question then became which type of flower and why? We thought of what flowers would fit into our home environment, as well as, as, well as what flowers would work to amplify the meaning behind our story. After many iterations, we landed on a baby sunflower for its representation of light, hope, and the potential for growth, fitting attributes for the hero of our story. Our cast of characters expanded from there, adding Stella the Cat, our antagonist. Luna, the sunflower's primary caretaker. And Ray, Luna's goofy husband. We hired Mira as a freelancer to help us with our concept art renderings. 
We incorporated shape theory into these designs by embracing rounded forms to convey our welcoming, cute aesthetic. Hi, my name is Elton Chow, and I'm one of the character modelers and general artists for Growing. I worked on the sunflower, creating three stages based on the concept art created by Mira. We originally imagined the sunflower physically growing and blooming as you played the game. But as our game evolved, we ended up sticking with just one stage of the character. My, son, my character modeling counterpart was Note Nujpreyoon, who created the character models for Ray, Luna, and their cats, Stella. Hi, my name is Deirdre Lu, and I was the mocap animator for the project. Our bubbly, childlike sunflower was brought to life with motion capture recorded on our stage at Drexel. Due to COVID, Malcolm and Jig M joined me over Zoom as remote directors while I was on the stage acting. For our couple, we sourced the animations from a motion capture library, Mixamo. Our magical cat was a little bit more tricky to animate. None of us had any experience with animating a quadruped, so we turned to Digic Pictures to provide Stella's animations. Their mocap data really brought to life our fiendish feline. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Ben Schoenerman. I worked on the user interface, playtesting, user experience, promotional materials, and the sound effects, which I'm going to take you behind the scenes of right now. So one of our core mechanics in the game, which you can see on screen right now, is the swing. Uh, the sound has a lot of layers to it. I'm just going to focus on two that you'll notice most in the game. So the first is the vine connection sound. So when the vine uh, locks into that hook, uh, I wanted the player to feel something clicky and satisfying. Uh, so the player immediately knows they hit the right button. Uh, now, due to COVID, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have access to a nice Foley studio or a fancy library, so I was limited to what was in my apartment here. Um, I looked around, and I found this, uh, this cool tea filter. Uh, made the perfect little mechanical clicky sound for when the vine locks into place and the release sound. It's just something like that. Um, the second part of the sound uh, was the character movement vocalization. So uh, a classic way to make Foley for a small character is to record the actor's voice and just pitch it up. Um, I think this works really well for our like, cute vibe in this game. So basically, I just spent an evening just shouting into my microphone and pitching it up. Uh, I thought it was pretty entertaining. So I'm going to take you all behind the scenes here real quick with this short video of that process. So uh, here's me. Yeah. Nya? Nya? And then, uh, here's the sunflower. Nya? 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 So another important sound for the game was the sunflower's footsteps. So we have this uh, soft, small little guy, and uh, while I might normally, like, put my hand in my shoes uh, to get footstep sounds, um, I needed something a bit more padded, uh, something a bit softer. So as a product of our time in coronavirus, uh, my first idea was to use this uh, roll of toilet paper um, for the footstep sounds. But it wasn't, it wasn't quite the right sound. I needed a little bit more body. Um, so I'll throw it again. And uh, this <laughs> paper towel roll um, is the final sound you hear in the game for the walking of the sunflower. All of these previously mentioned characters are presented in our current narrative that follows the Sunflower's perilous journey in rescuing their caretakers from mischievous magical cats. This wasn't always going to be our narrative, however. We initially wanted to make a game about the mourning process where each environment would represent a different stage of grief. A fire world representing anger, an ice world representing depression, a shadow world representing bargaining. As we moved forward in production and cuts were made, this version of our narrative became out of scope. So we pivoted by repurposing assets and changing our narrative framework to what it is today. Despite this change, many of our original assets still remain, as exemplified by our environmental design. Hi, Austin here. I'm the technical director and VFX artist for Growing. I've had the great privilege of making all of the shaders and particle systems for the game, as well as working in different technical areas throughout the game pipeline. Here, you can see the study transitioning from a warm yellow environment to an icy blue. We don't have any verbal dialogue or narrative text in our game, so we used environmental storytelling to have the world influence the story. The levels needed to convey a lot of information, so through the power of visual effects, we were able to bring our environments to life. 
some of the most powerful tools we have in making effects such as stylized snow and lava feel great to play with and even better to look at are shaders and particle systems. Who would want to walk through a basic house, avoiding cats as a sunflower, when you could transform the environment to make it more enticing to explore and have the floor actually be lava? Hi, I'm Jake McKenna, the lead designer on Growing, and I'm here to tell you about our character's abilities and our level design. Our first ability was the swing. The sunflower throws a vine to attach and swing from grapple points. The idea was to give players this ability early since it's so core to our gameplay. And it was designed in a way that prevents the player from gaining significant altitude, making it a perfect early game ability, and sets up the introduction of our vertical movement with our next ability, the glide. The player deploys their leaves to glide through the air. The glide was designed to broadly open up exploration for the player when paired with high altitude jumps and wind zones. Finally, the dash is our last ability in the game. It's the most interactive. The player dashes forward at high speed for a short distance. The dash opens up our biggest environmental interaction, object pushing, when players collide with a pushable object that's knocked back along a path. Next up, we have our level designs. We ended up using three different styles of level design that we felt best fit each ability in the game. First up, the study was designed around the swing. It's a linear, collectible guided level where you search for keys to unlock your next ability. This was the best way to accommodate the swing, which requires good alignment. This level was designed to be a low pressure start to the game where you could slowly teach a player mechanics and story. Next up, we have the kitchen, which was designed for the glide. The kitchen is a non-linear level with collectibles scattered around. There isn't a tightly defined path to allow the player to glide around and explore at their leisure. The kitchen was designed around themes of denial and anger. It includes many more environmental hazards in previous rooms. And finally, we have the attic, which was made for the dash. It's all about timing and puzzle solving following a linear format. Players use the dash to push objects to provide cover to hide from the cat. The attic is the highest pressure environment in the game. The player moves through dark shadows, avoiding the cat's gaze while making use of every ability they've gained thus far. Wow, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely want to play Hide and Seek with Stella the Cat. If you would also like to play, please check out our game at growingthegame.net. For your convenience, pause the video, pull out your phone's camera, and scan the QR code. It will take you directly to our website. This is the team that you've met today, but this game would have not been possible without the collaboration of our computer science team. Massive thank yous to all these gentlemen. We would also like to thank our freelancers who volunteered their time to provide additional help in the areas of concept art, animation, modeling, and music. And also to our advisors, Dan, Jeff, and Rob, who guided us throughout the entire process. And finally, Digic Pictures, who helped bring Sell the Cat to life. And finally, thank you to all of you for viewing our presentation. Pause the video now, pull out your phone, scan the QR code. It'll take you to our website, but make sure to come back. The showcase isn't over just yet. Okay, that that was absolutely great. That was absolutely great, and uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce uh, one of our younger alumni, uh, Taylor Swatansky. She graduated in two thousand eighteen, and. Uh, she has been nominated for a 2021 IGF no award, the Nuovo Award, which is an absolutely outstanding uh, accomplishment. So uh, let's welcome Taylor. Hi, Heartscape. Um, congratulations on making growing. It was really great. Thank, Thank you um, so much. Uh, I just want to say that I did get to play the game uh, on your website, the version you had up. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought that um, in terms of the design, it seemed like you really emphasized what you could do to make a good experience in terms of a 3D platformer. Um, and I thought that was really cool. Um, you didn't necessarily stick to one mechanic for the whole game, which is something that some teams do, but um, I really enjoyed that, like, your game was really fun to play from beginning to end. Um, I uh, really enjoyed the middle part with The Floor is Lava. Not only were the visual effects great, um, I'm totally into shaders, that's my thing. So like, um, I really enjoyed that and how the environment kind of moves and breathes. Um, what I wanna know too um, with that level specifically is 
how you design that and how you went through that process, because it really isn't nonlinear. There are so many great sight lines and ways that you can see the environment and see what you need to do. Um, so can you tell me a little bit like how that process was in terms of play testing and production? Yeah, I think I can take that one. So that we actually initially started off with the concept of making a Metroidvania game, which is a, a very nonlinear format where you retraverse areas. And after you unlock new abilities, you can access different points of levels that you've been to before. So the kitchen actually started off way back as a Metroidvania level in the very first iteration of the game. And then it's changed hands many times. I think almost everybody in the project that touched it at one point, but that's kind of how we initially started with that very open concept was because we actually started in a different genre and it ended up helping us out a lot in the end. That's great. That's great. Um, when I, now you said like, oh, you originally planned it to be a Metroidvania and so much goes into like the production of a game, especially a senior project where things are so crazy and like you're trying to learn on the fly, you're taking what you've learned throughout your four years and you're really just like seeing how to do it with time constraints and resource constraints. Um, so my question is, if you could go back right now, totally restart fresh slate, had another year and you started from scratch with this game, what would you change um, either in terms of design or in terms of how you approach production? I think as the producer, I would go back and refine our production, learning from all of our mistakes along the way, right? Like file naming conventions, how to move around files, just like all the technical little things that we had to figure out along the way. All of the other prob like the changes that we made like creatively, I wouldn't change those for the world because then the game wouldn't be what it is. But technical problems, I, I can deal without those. <laughs> Yeah, I think just adding on to that, just to mention that um, we challenged ourselves to use both Perforce and Shotgun, which are new uh, production pipeline tools uh, for us as a team. And so uh, while we wanted to definitely learn that and we grew professionally to as learning that, it also um, allowed for hiccups to be uh, introduced along the way, uh, which slowed down our efficiencies. So That's great, great. Um... And you also said that you did cut a lot of content because that's kind of the nature of this um, and any projects because you have time, certain amount of time, certain amount of um, skill sets or whatever. Um, so if you um, had like another year starting from where you are now, what would you add on to the game? What would you do in terms of the environment too? That seemed like a very large um, emphasis of your game. If we had an entire extra year, we'd probably bring back the basement, which was a whole other room. The basement was originally going to have the light and shadow theme from the attic, and the attic was going to be more um, icy themed. When we when we cut the the grief approach, we had to really shift everything a little bit. So maybe going back to the original framework that would be nice, because then we can have a story which with a lot more depth to it, right? Yeah, I think a, a creative um, pitfall that we just put ourselves into just naturally as going through this is that our grief narrative relied on having five levels because we wanted to explore the five different stages of grief. And so in order to explore that narrative, we had to have five levels, which we didn't accomplish. However, like Annie was saying, we could absolutely move forward, increase the amount of levels we have, reintroduce that narrative, so. It's an incredible fantasy, right? but also uh, some sort of a torture film, perhaps. All right, you've finally gotten to the end of a year long senior project. Now go back and do it again. Um, unfortunately, it looks like uh, Taylor has been frozen. Um, uh, yes, that or uh, oh, almost. I am, I am here though. Oh, wonderful. All right, well, so just a, a, a chance for a last sort of comment um, uh, before we uh, draw to a close and, and move on to our, our final team of the day. But uh, sort of, Taylor, any sort of closing thoughts on this team? They tried for a huge emotional arc in the beginning and then had to really, that was one of the biggest, hardest decisions they had to do. And your project that has been IGF nominated is an emotional 
interesting, challenging experience and sort of trying to translate that to the game space. That's sort of where my mind is thinking in terms of. Yeah, um, I, I think for the future, just keep trying to emphasize those emotional experiences, try to prioritize them. Um, sometimes when you're making an experience like that, um, you have to prioritize that over things like mechanics because that's just um, a sacrifice that you have to make. So I would think about that, about what is the emphasis of your game and what experience you're trying to get across to the players. Tough challenges for the junior teams plotting their senior projects for next year. Um, but uh, uh, Heartscape Studio will have to be satisfied with the fun platformer experience that they've done and those mischievous, what was the what, mischievous? So there was mischievous magical cats. Misch See, I can't even say it. Mischievous magical cats and uh, frisky felines, or or what have you. You had a lot of alliteration in there. Um, all right. Well, I thank the team uh, for sharing your project with us today. Thank you so much for that, Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, good luck and con uh, congratulations on the IGF uh, Nuovo Award uh, nomination. And uh, everybody should check out Taylor's project as well. Um, cause we want to support our alums just as much as we support our graduating seniors. Um, we're going to go take a look at one last animation and visual effects reel showcasing, uh, the crossover of the real time and the pre-rendered in some incredible unreal, uh, samples that have come from our students, uh, recently. So with that animation, uh, visual effects, unreal clip, then we're going to take it to our last and final team. But once again, thank you, Heartscape Studio. Let's go to the next one. Excellent. And we are back for our final team of the day, a game design and production and computer science uh, game production combination team of great renown, Excellent Studios with their project, Vivarium. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our showcase presentation. We are Excellent Studios, and this is Vivarium.
Our hardworking team is comprised of six senior game design students. My name is Taylor Andrews. I am the digital media lead. My name is Aaron Bruner. I worked on character animations. My name is Giovanni D'Agostino. I worked on the UI screens. My name is Joe Kadesny. I worked on icons and sound effects. We also have Kevin Miao. He worked on 3D modeling. And my name is Ethan Schottemeyer. I worked on the textures and the UVs. The Excellent team is also comprised of six seniors from the College of Computing and Informatics. My name is Ryan Morphy. I am the project lead. My name is Sabak Aldadze. I'm the technical director. And our general programmers are Christian Gossett, Alexander Ho, David Kaiser, and Dennis Lochran. Welcome, new recruits. Please enjoy our training video. Vivarium is largely based on the environment of the enclosure, the vivarium. Every vivarium that you traverse through is randomly generated. Each enclosure offers new and unique challenges every time you enter. Your goal is to travel from one vivarium to another, either by defeating all the enemies in your way or making it to the tunnel that connects the vivariums. Be careful, new recruits. While there are three species of insects willing to fight for your squadron, there is also a greater enemy. The main enemy in Vivarium is the Queen Bee. She waits in the final enclosure for your squadron to battle her. First, she summons her swarm of bee minions to fight while she attacks from a distance. Be aware that when you come closer, she will spring into action and fight directly. She has a huge health pool and high damage, so be careful. Before you can fight the queen, you must defeat or bypass the rest of her insect army. These enemies grow in strength and number the closer to the queen bee you get. But don't worry, you have an army of your own. The first species of insect in your squadron is the ant. The ant is able to carry two extra items in its inventory. Ants travels far, reaching chests uh, and bypassing enemies more quickly. The second species of insect is the bee. The bee can fly over water tiles by bypassing all enemies that may be in its path. Bees are very powerful, but dangerous to use as attackers uh, as they hit hard but fall fast. The last species of insect is the beetle. Beetles draw attention of the enemies uh, and can outlast their attacks. They, can move very they can't move very fast, but will soak up damage and protect your other weaker bugs. Do not worry, new recruits. You will have access to various weapons inside the vivariums. There are eight different kinds of weapons. Each weapon has its own unique attack. Shown here are the Clip Sword and the Graphite Bow. The Clip Sword can bypass walls and attack three spaces in front of the unit. The Graphite Bow can sacrifice some damage for additional range. The next set of weapons shown are the Screw Lance and the Thumbtack. The Screw Lance can rotate the target clockwise by 90 degrees. The Thumbtack can deal great damage at the cost of being able to move. Here is a demonstration of these attacks in battle. The Cleave can attack in, a, can attack in an area around the character. After each battle, you are offered different rewards. When a member of your squadron fall during battle, their deaths are permanent. In order to grow your army, you are offered a new recruit to help you in your quest to defeat the queen. In weapon reward screens, choose between two new weapons to help fight during battle. Switch between your weapons while traversing through the vivariums. In addition to rewards at the end of each battle, there are also lootable chests within each vivarium. The loot from these chests can range from stat boosting, to healing, to defensive items. One of the possible lootable items from chests are stat boosters. Here we can see the bee using a movement potion to be able to permanently move further. The other stat boosting item is an attack potion, which permanently increases attack damage. When a member of your squadron is equipped with a shield, they gain an additional health bar that will protect from attacks. There are three different shields. The weakest is the acorn shield, 
the medium strength is the cap shield, and the strongest is the George Washington shield. Healing items are single use and allow a member from your squadron to recover damage that was dealt to them. Similar to the shields, there are three different levels of healing. The sugar cube, the drop of honey, and the aloe extract. You are able to swap items and weapons between your squadron's inventories. Use this ability to give healing items to wounded characters, exchange weapons, or utilize the ant's ability to carry more items than the other members. Here is what to expect in battle as you prepare to fight against the Queen Bee. In you always start out with four characters, one of each species and a fourth of a random species. Each character can move and attack once per turn, uh, which is shown by these icons right above the health bar. To show that off, I'm going to select our B and move it next to this enemy ant. Then I'll select the attack I want to use and select the enemy to attack them. When I end my turn, the enemies are going to make decisions based on what they think is best. They might do an offensive or a defensive maneuver. We, we now see these two ants moving and attacking our B because it just approached them. We would like to give a special thanks to our personal advisors, Professor Frank Lee, Professor Rob Lloyd, and Professor Jeff Salvage. Without their help, we wouldn't have been able to make this game. Also, thank you to the other advisors that we met with along the way, who gave us a lot of feedback and advice that was vital to our success. And a huge thank you to all the students, friends, family, faculty, alumni, and our classmates for playtesting our game and giving us a lot of useful feedback as we continue to design and develop our game. Your comments and opinions have helped us change and adapt our game to be the best it could possibly be in this short year. We would also like to invite the audience to download and play Vivarium by visiting our website, xlantstudios.wordpress.com, or by scanning the QR code on the screen for more information about our game, the link to play, and a way to contact us if you have further questions. What a great, great ending to this great show. Let's give one big kind of virtual applause to, to, to the team. Uh, for a really really great game and in the tradition of kind of ending on a strong note i also like to invite one of our strongest alumni recent alumnus taga ebert he graduated in 2013. Uh, he started his career at uh, turn 10 games and he's now content lead at parallel domain Tag. hey how's it going everyone congratulations okay. on hey can you hear me yes we can hear you Excellent. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on finishing the senior project. I know it's a huge accomplishment and a lot of hours spent, I'm sure, over the course of the last year. Um, yeah, awesome senior project. The The level of complexity to do like a strategy game with a whole bunch of different game design elements, like stat boosts, eight different weapons, and randomly generated levels on top of that is uh, a lot of things that if done alone would be uh, kind of potentially overscoped, but it looks like you hit everything and managed to get it all done, which is extremely impressive. And you guys should be proud of that. Um, one of the first questions that I've got for you guys is with stuff like procedural generation, that's something that I've got a, a lot of experience in. When it comes to game design, uh, I feel like there's this balance of randomly generate everything to make sure that the player has a good experience. Um, through your play testing, what was the uh, methods or, or things that you learned to help it so that the, the procedural generation was good and, and able to make the game better and not something that made it too difficult to play test or find bugs. So uh, very early on, we actually had a few ideas for heuristics we were gonna use to make the procedural generation uh, fun. So, you know, we, we had a few ideas for things that would make sure that levels were guaranteed winnable. And one thing we learned after playtesting for a while is that players were often confused when certain areas of the map would be generated that just weren't relevant. Like they wouldn't have enemies there, they wouldn't be required to go to get to the goal. So we would generate these areas that, that weren't useful that would confuse players. So we wound up creating the, the chest mechanic to solve that. So we specifically always solve uh, spawn chests in quadrants of the map that either enemies aren't on or the player isn't gonna go to when going to the path to the goal. So that was one major thing we changed uh, with procedural generation because of playtesting. Nice. Yeah, it's a good idea of adding new new mechanics to kind of fill those gaps and, and make it fun for the player. 
Um, also, I, I guess when you're making a game, uh, you guys had a, a pretty good sized team, but I feel like no, no team is ever big enough to really make a game that you're trying to do. Uh, were there any moments where people on your team kind of uh, were operating outside of their wheelhouse or, or learning, learning new stuff to, to get the game done that they, they might not have expected that they needed to do at the beginning of the project? So that there was actually a, a lot of that. Uh, in our team. So while we have six social media members and six CCI members, um, only one of our CCI members, Saba, who's here today, has, I guess I had a little bit of experience with Unity. Um, Saba has a lot of experience with Unity and our other four CCI members had never opened Unity, had never used C Sharp before. Uh, so a very large amount of our team uh, you know, learned Unity from scratch. A lot of our digital media members didn't have a lot of experience with GitHub and uh, that kind of version control. So they had to learn a lot of how to use a virgin control pipeline, uh, which you know, we, we made sure to use a lot of. So I, I think everyone on the team actually did a, a lot of stuff that they've never done before. That's awesome, especially when it's like GitHub and, and Unity and stuff that in the industry is professionally used. It, it's good to, to be learning that stuff and learning it quickly. Um, and with the game being uh, very bug themed, uh, I love that all of the, the power ups and everything were it, it all felt thematically relevant from like the drop of honey to the little thumbtacks and that kind of stuff. Uh, with games, there's also always a bunch of bugs. Uh, what Was there a fun bug that you guys remember from the game or, or any sort of favorite bug that might have been like the challenging one to solve, but once, uh, once you figured it out, it was better? Um, I can answer one that I can think of off the top of my head, um, which I give a lot of credit to um, our rigger, Aaron Bruner was there was an issue with like um, the queen bee model. Uh, she originally had a long cocktail, like a long dress um, as part of her design. But after issues with um, the model not being quite ready to rig um, and like the whole idea of a dress, trying to get that together, um, just watching that kind of like bug, I guess, happen. Um, it was very interesting and our team really did put it together and fix it. And now she's in the game. She's a big part of our project. Nice. Really, it's amazing uh, what you guys were able to uh, accomplish. And I know Saba carried uh, a, a lot of heavy weight in here because I saw it happen. I'd make a comment in one week and the next week there would be a new mechanic or some system that solved that challenge. And I got to tell you, I mean, talk watching them evolve this that rapidly and be that responsive is really, this is a very impressive team and they accomplished a great deal. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's five o'clock. We've been at this for four hours and I think everybody deserves a huge round of applause. Um, I want to thank uh, um, our team here, uh, Excellent Studios, for joining us and, and sharing this project with us to close out our show. Uh, I am so happy and pleased to see Tuck again and have him come in to join this conversation, even on the road, right? He's just like somewhere out there and uh, calling in. I am so thankful for you sharing your time with us today. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is I sort of want to breathe for a moment. Michael and I have some sort of closing thoughts that we we want to bring here. Uh, and then I actually, I want to bring everybody back in, whoever is still out there. I know we lost a couple of our seniors that had to go off and do work because we have working students who've got to go pay the bills as well as earn that degree. So I know we lost a few people along the way, but I'm hoping we can get everybody back in. But first, let's uh, shrink it down to just uh, Michael and myself for a moment. And then, so you guys actually stay in the room. You can just hide your camera for a moment that's the secret sauce and uh and then we'll bring you back in just a moment but thank you all so much um whew, i don't know about you michael but i'm exhausted and i didn't even do all the heavy work today um today doesn't happen without an army of people um but today really does not happen if uh, 25 plus years ago, uh, my wife and I did not create a brilliant little man who's grown up to take care of us today as our stage manager um, and just running it beautifully and keeping us under control. Uh, he doesn't want to come in full screen, so we'll we'll have him join us. <laughs> we'll have him join in in just a moment. We'll hang out just a moment. I wanted I, I there's there's so much running through my head right now. Um, but uh, 
all the faculty, you know, not just as advisors to the teams directly, but um, all the, the faculty who made themselves available um, to, uh, to the, the teams all the time. So many different meetings happened, so much different feedback happened, um, helping out all these different teams. Um, so, and the CCI faculty running their side of it and the integration between the two programs. I'm really, I'm always impressed and very pleased to get to this stage of the process. Um, but I'm pretty much out of words at this point, Michael, if you've got some thoughts uh, before we bring in the the rest of the gang, um, who whoever is still uh, hanging around in the Discord channel, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts? <laughs> See, <laughs> a couple of things really. Um, first of all, an enormous pride about being part of this program and seeing so many excellent students and so so much great work. The fact that we were able to fill four hours with quality work from the beginning to the end is is outstanding. Um, and uh, and I also would like to echo one thing that you said about the uh, professionalism with which this. Uh, this this show went 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 on. I actually kind of recorded some background, so so at some point we might want to want to share that, that the, the professionalism also with, with which Calder kind of kind of managed the entire process in the background. People have no idea what how complex it actually was at at, at the end. Um, I'd like to just add a couple of thank yous uh, to my lady Bridges and Jervis Thompson for wrangling all the people in the Discord channel and bringing them into the into the individual sessions so that we could actually manage to have everybody have everybody on screen at the right time. Um, and I I would also in addition I would like to thank our leadership at the Westfall College in particular our new dean Jason Schuppack who who joined us uh, this year and hasn't seen many of us in person yet because essentially we were constantly, constantly uh, remote. And uh, last but not least, and that's uh, very important for me, I'd like to thank our assistant Daphne Wright. Uh, she is sort of the one person that keeps everything running. And without her, essentially, we would not be where we are today. Uh, and and that, that that essentially says something, uh, essentially, because we are actually doing very well. And I, and I need to also say, Rob, you did an outstanding job. The thing that kind of really stuck with me, or that, that really is, is absolutely astonishing, is that we are right on time. It's a five, it's a four hour show, and you were kind of spot on, like like on on the second. Um uh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> so, so this was this was very well managed, and uh, I, I I'd like to thank everybody else who I might have forgotten. And and other than that, I would I would turn it over to Rob uh, for the final mm -hmm. for the final uh, things for the final pictures and everything, and uh, you know, kind of see everybody next year because we are going to do something like this again, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, we'll keep on doing it as long as the seniors keep on making these incredible projects. And with that, um, I want to welcome in, I've actually come on in all you seniors, turn on your cameras, uh, jump in the pool and, uh, you know, congratulations. Uh, I, for me, this is an emotional moment, uh, just as much for the students in a different way. Erin Bruner of, uh, excellent studios did her high, senior high school um, internship with me for a couple of weeks before she started here as a student. I was there at the moment that Annie Acosta made the decision to come to Drexel and told her mom, I'm buying a sweatshirt. And I was there to be at that a moment. And it still, it still cuts me to the quick every time I, I, I pull back that memory. But we have so many people um, you know, please join, turn on your video so we can get you into the big gallery view. Yes, look at this just popping up, just senior after senior after senior. It is amazing what you have accomplished. Um, and uh, we're all incredibly proud of you. And thank you so much for putting in the work, not only to make these incredible projects, these wonderful projects, these beautiful, inventive, creative, uh, um, beautiful projects that you then figured out how to present them and tell the story about the making of them. Um, so thank you so much for all of that. Uh, we have multiple screens. Look at this. We have just tons and tons of seniors. Give your all selves a virtual unmute. Uh, uh, Zoom can never handle 50, 60, 70 people making noise, but 
<sighs> class of 2021, you may still have a couple of weeks and maybe a final or two to deal with, but to me, you've done it. You've finished it. You've brought this to a close. Congratulations. Woo-hoo. All right. I have to get a screen grab of this. This is important stuff here. All right. Go class of 2021. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Woo-hoo. Pop in. Woo-hoo. You did it. Woo-hoo. All right, and a final shout out to our people keeping the chat YouTube chat stream uh, clean. Uh, e and Sarah, thank you so much for doing that, and everyone who made this show possible. Um, you're really done now. I'm sh- all right. You probably have a paper or something like that to write. But congratulations, everyone. Um, if we stay on here, uh, we're going to ruin my four hour perfect show timing. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you all for doing such great work. Thanks for sharing it with us today. Thank you so much to all the alums who made their time and energy available for this. There's Calder. He is live up in his attic, uh, emergency broadcast attic, too many monitors, not enough fans. Thank you, Calder. Uh, I'm going to give the closing word to you, actually, Calder. You did a great job today. And thank you for bringing your EAM, uh, degree to force for this. Well, uh, speaking of that, um, you guys all talked about how challenging it was because of my EAM education and my experience through this program. Not actually that difficult. Only took about two days to set up. Uh, yeah, I've, I've run harder shows. Uh, so with a lot of help from you guys uh, and everyone who's been involved, uh, it's, it's just been, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I was on your guys' side last year uh, you know, in the emergency, uh, oh no, we have to do it, uh, recorded over zoom. Um, so getting a little bit of time to prepare was probably a blessing and a curse. So, uh, it sucks that it had to be this way, but you know what you guys pulled through and pull out some really amazing, uh, projects and I'm, I'm sorely impressed. Um, so well done to everyone. Uh, thank you all for listening and being helpful and working really hard. Uh, and I will go ahead and uh, sign us off, I suppose. There we go. Get your last whoops in. Unmute. Whoop. Whoop. Raise the roof. Let's go. Raise the roof. Love, let's go. Raise the roof. Graduation soon. Oh, yeah. Y'all. All right. <laughs>